Hey, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. We are continuing with our council budget study sessions. Today we will be taking on public safety and neighborhood services. Tony, would you take the role? Jimenez? Torres? Present. Cohen? Ortiz? Here. Davis? Doan? Present. Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kame? Mayhan? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right. Why don't we jump in to the staff presentation? And thank you all for being here. Good morning. My name is Robert Sapien. I'm the fire chief. It is my pleasure to open staff's presentation for the Public Safety City Service Area, or CSA, for fiscal year 2023-2024's proposed operating budget. The Public Safety CSA includes the Fire Department, Police Department, the Office of Emergency Management, and the Office of the Independent Police Auditor. Co-presenting with me today are Police Chief Anthony Mata, OEM Director Raymond Reardon, and Independent Police Auditor Siobhan Nura. Collectively, the Public Safety CSA mission is to provide prevention and emergency response services for crime, fire, medical, hazardous, and disaster-related situations. Public Safety CSA outcomes are, one, the public feels safe anywhere, anytime in San Jose, and two, residents share the responsibility for public safety. The fire department's mission is to protect life, property, and the environment through prevention and response, providing all hazards emergency response, including fire, rescue, hazardous materials, and emergency medical services. The department's secondary public safety answering point, our fire communications center, is an International Academies of Emergency Dispatch accredited center of excellence delivering both emergency medical and fire priority dispatch service protocols, dispatching over 103,000 calls for service annually. The fire department's training division is a California State Fire Marshal accredited local academy, delivering ongoing mandated and career development trainings internally. Fire prevention services include arson investigation, plan reviews, inspection and permitting, and public education. The Independent Police Auditor provides independent civilian oversight of the San Jose Police Department by taking in complaints from members of the public about the San Jose Police Officers, auditing internal and external misconduct investigations, preparing annual public reports, making recommendations to improve SJPD policies, and participating in the department's review of officer-involved shooting incidents and conducting community outreach and engagement. The role of the Office of Emergency Management is to guide the city's emergency management program and to promote and collaborate with our regional and community partners to build a comprehensive and sustainable posture of resilience. For the police department, the core services include crime prevention and community education, response to calls for service and patrol support, investigative services, and regulatory services. In terms of budget programs that the city has implemented, this slide represents a sample of our CSA's programs. The full program listing can be found in the department's sections of the proposed operating budget. For the fire department, budget programs include fire and emergency medical services response to provide residents high quality fire and medical response services in their most critical time of need fire and EMS dispatch to ensure clear communication and appropriate deployment of resources as the department's first responders, and special operations including the hazardous incident team, urban search and rescue, and aircraft rescue firefighting. Fire sworn training, fire safety education, review and inspections. The city's independent police auditor 
budget programs include oversight of police misconduct complaints and public outreach, independent police auditor management and administration, and for the Office of Emergency Management, the budget programs include Community Emergency Response Team, Emergency Operations Center Capital Project, Community-Focused Emergency Planning. And finally, for the Police Department, the budget programs include Field Patrol, 911 Communications Center, Special Operations, and other patrol support units, Crime Prevention, Coffee with a Cop, School Safety, and School Liaison. Homicide, sexual assaults, gang investigations, family violence and internal affairs, gaming, cannabis regulation, and police permits. This slide. This slide uh, represents our CSA's performance measure dashboard, which can also be found on page 287 of the 2023-2024 proposed operating budget book. For the police department, our three, top three measures are listed here as one priority, call, priority one calls, which includes present and immediate danger to life or major damage or loss of property. This measure includes call processing time, call queuing time, and drive time. The target for this measure is to respond within six minutes, 70% of the time. This response time has decreased slightly. For priority two calls, which include injury or property damage or a potential for either to occur. This measure includes as well call, press, call processing time, call queuing time, and drive time. The target for this measure is to respond within 11 minutes 70% of the time. This response time has also decreased. And for part one crimes, which are the seven index crimes, these crimes are defined by the National Uniform Crime Reporting Standards. The Office of Emergency Management targets at least 80% of assigned emergency operations center staff to receive required training. The overall count of staff positions increased this year due to the addition of the recovery section, which increased the number of staff requiring training. The fire department response time standard for priority one, red lights and siren, response is arrival within eight minutes, 80% of the time, including call processing, turnout, and travel time. For priority two calls, the response standard is arrival within 13 minutes, 94% of the, of the time. The fire department has experienced an increase in medical emergency responses requiring more frequent accompaniment in ambulance transports, thus resulting in impacts to fire resource availability and longer response times. The total public safety CSA proposed budget for 2023-2024 shows almost a net zero change with the exception of the Office of Emergency Management. The 1.2% reduction reflected in the proposed fire department budget is attributable to one-time general fund dollars appropriated in 2022-2023, as, well as, as well as alternate service delivery to fortify and realign the department's position in achieving an equitable and manageable level in response times for command staff for the eastern and central areas of San Jose. The reduction of the proposed Office of Emergency Management budget reflects one-time grant funding, that's $4.5 million in one-time grant funding, to purchase items such as the MOSES or the Satellite Emergency Communications Unit. Uh, it's the funding, initial funding of phase one for a soft story, <coughs> and, a, uh, and PSPS grants that were received from Cal OES. Uh, and additional other funds not tapped due to the, our response to COVID. In addition to the figures provided in the table shown, the 2023 and 2024 proposed CSA total includes funding for the EOC reallocation uh, capital contributions uh, within the Public Works Department, which is about a uh, half a million dollars. The Public Safety CSA serves to maintain a vibrant and safe community. 
We do this with a collaborative, collaborative approach in providing essential emergency services that meets the community's needs with a focus on the use of data analytics to inform and improve strategies. Specifically, the following service delivery strategies are anticipated to continue as we enter into the upcoming fiscal year. The fire department will continue to provide high quality fire suppression, rescue, emergency medical, and other related public assistance services. The police department's goal is to maintain the safety of residents throughout the city by keeping crime rates down, reducing and investigating crime, and also we will focus on hiring and training highly qualified officers and provide effective and timely response to calls for service. The Independent Police Auditor's Office will continue to ensure that the San Jose Police Department's investigations of police misconduct are fair, thorough, and complete. Sean justos, completos, y detallados. And the Office of Emergency Management will continue to deliver internal trainings, enhance the CERT program, and engage in community outreach for emergency preparedness, enhancing the city's readiness for the next major event. The following are a few key budget actions for the Public Safety CSA, which includes for the Fire Department, addition of one-time personal services and non-personal equipment funding of $1.6 million for Lateral Firefighting Paramedic Academy to begin in early August 2023 to address paramedic shortages experienced nationwide, as well as $1.2 million to add a sixth battalion to fortify the command and control over emergency responses along the eastern and central areas of San Jose. The police department addition of one-time funding of 1.3 million for recruiting and backgrounding for sworn and non-sworn vacancies and also adding two forensic analysts and one system applications programmer positions ongoing to the police department's crime intelligence data center. And for the Office of, of Emergency Management, addition of one-time non-personal equipment funding of 85,000 for conducting additional city staff training and purchasing needed emergency provisions for the Emergency Operations Center. The training and exercise, exercises will enhance the skills and capabilities of the personnel assigned to the EOC and the Department Operations Center. The Public Safety CSA maintains ongoing engagement with the administration and community and the community we serve to evaluate and evolve to provide the highest quality services. For the Fire Department, we will continue to seek ways to improve emergency response times and delivery of services. The Police Department will continue to deliver high quality police services in order to maintain a vibrant and safe community. The Independent Police Auditor's Office will work with the community and staff to bring more police reform proposals across the goal line. And the Office of Emergency Management will continue to improve the city's and residents' readiness, deliver the CERT program, and respond to emergencies. In summary, preserving emergency response capacity remains the highest priority of this CSA. Resources will continue to be focused on providing essential emergency services in a timely manner in order to protect life, property, and the environment. We will continue to look for efficiencies, leverage technologies, funding opportunities, and data analytics in order to improve service levels to address crime, medical, and fire-related situations successfully. This concludes the public safety CSA presentation. We stand ready to respond to any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you for the presentation. Let's go to public comment. No comment. Okay, we will go to Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, first off, I just wanna thank staff, uh, especially um, our, our fire chief and our police chief. 
um, for their efforts in putting together these budget recommendations. Um, I'm sure public safety is a priority for many of us here on the council, but as the council member for East San Jose, it's, it's definitely a priority uh, for me and, and in my community. Um, so I, I did have a question, given that public safety was a priority, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of increasing staff levels, and I saw that on page 523 um, in the fire department, we are uh, recommending an elimination of the 3.0 filled fire captain positions currently assigned to the emergency medical services field coordinator function. Uh, I just have a quick question. Would, uh, just thinking about our constituents, would our constituents, people may be attending a huge event in our district or if there's a large, you know, God forbid crash that, that results in casualties, could our constituents potentially be losing services um, given this uh, uh, position provides life-saving uh, services and medical rehabilitation for our firefighters? Thank you, council member, for the question. Um, so a, a couple of background um, details regarding that reduction. The current daily staffing levels in the fire department uh, are 190. Uh, so we, we put 190 uh, individuals who are sworn uh, in the streets every day uh, and maintain that staffing at all times. This proposal combined with the addition of the battalion chief position will continue to maintain 190 uh, personnel on duty every day. More specific to your question, uh, the uh, paramedic field coordinator or, or that resource known as Med30 uh, does hold uh, a, a myriad of uh, daily services uh, and we will be tasked if, if this proposal goes forward as is to make sure that we have a landing place for each of those roles that Med30 plays. So the short answer to your question is our intent is to make sure that no diminution of services occur. However, um, because uh, of the nature of Med30 uh, is that it does not have a, a particular response area to stay anchored to, it, it's been a very good utility player in our system that, that does a variety of things and can provide you know, uh, support throughout the city. So we are gonna have a, an adjustment to make, um, but I don't believe uh, it will reduce services or safety to the community. Thank you. The, the one thing I'm, I'm worried about is maybe hiring someone and, and expecting them to do the work that that eliminated position uh, is doing and then do a, a new role, um, which I would hate to see happen to the, the suggested battalion chief. Is it possible that we could find room, to, room in the budget um, for both positions? Hey, Council Member, thank you for the question. Jim Shannon, budget, budget uh, director. So the proposed budget that is brought before you is a fully balanced uh, proposal. So the reduction of that one, 1 1.2 million is factored into the overall balanced general fund budget. So for those, for, so to back off of that reduction of, of cost, um, something and something else would need to be reduced in the general fund to accommodate that change. So there is an opportunity to identify some funds if we give something up. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if council wanted to direct a, a, a different way to do the, the proposed budget, that is an option, certainly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, council member. Council member Foley. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and, and for your presentation. And, and before I get started with a couple of questions that I have, I want to thank uh, publicly Station 9 for bringing a fire engine to my Music in the Valley event a couple of weeks ago. Kids loved to climb along in that engine and, and had a good time. And I also want to thank Police Department for providing their free ice cream that they like to do. So if council members haven't done that yet, be sure to reach out to them because a lot of people said, I'm only here for the ice cream. And, I said, okay, come for the ice cream, stay for the music, and they did. So thank you all for that. Um, just following briefly on the Med30 um, request is uh, because we, I'm, I'm concerned about that loss of position too, and we actually put in a cost estimate yesterday to fund, uh, to bring those position fundings back. Um, so we'll, we'll see where that goes in the budget. I realize we have to give something up, but 
it's really important, given that we have a medic shortage, that we have someone in that position who can help facilitate and lead and fill in as a utility player, as you said, uh, Chief, to to help us through. So um, I, I, you've already pretty much answered that question, but I did want to just say that we put in a cost estimate and hope to get that back into the budget somehow. We'll see. We need to find out all of the details. A um, couple of questions I have uh, is in, in looking at the budget, we've seen an alarming increase in the number of rapes, 22.5% increase from 21 to 22, and 28.6% from the year average. Chief, what, in your opinion, what's causing this uptick, and does the budget provide you with the necessary resources to, um, to turn around this trend? Thank you for the question, Councilmember. Um, as we report out in the uh, PISFIS, the Public Safety uh, Strategic Support Committee, um, we've seen an increase in the last uh, year of, uh, of rapes, and um, we believe it's due to the intersectionality reporting form and tool uh, that um, we implemented at the request of uh, then Councilmember Sylvia Rennes, where uh, when we respond to either domestic violence uh, or any other type of um, gender-based violence um, incident, uh, we use this tool, and as a result, they're uh, reporting uh, more uh, incidents of, uh, of rape. Uh, so that's something that we've been reporting out uh, at the PISFIS committee. Um, in terms of um, um, resources, um, we do have uh, the appropriate resources. I, I believe in, in this budget we, we are, we're going to continue uh, with uh, some of the, um, the analysts uh, that uh, we have to look at those trends. Uh, we are doing uh, outreach uh, through our sexual assault um, unit. Uh, what they are going to do is uh, conduct outreach to various community uh, or segments of our community that are, are being affected by uh, this uh, type of, uh, of crime. So that's something that we're going to continue doing uh, and keeping uh, an eye on uh, for, you know, again, um, the survivors of, of these type of crimes. Thank you. So it's... Uh the to understand your response uh, i'm not on PISVIS, so i don't get those reports but what you're saying is because of the way that data is collected we're seeing we have more uh rapes that, uh, that we're uh, identifying and tracking than we had previously in a prior system that's one but again we're asking when we uh, we're, we're conducting the investigation so survivors are more apt to reporting right uh that, that specific crime which we're seeing the increase in those numbers great okay good anything we can do to help to to decrease that budget it, since we're talking about the budget uh, let let us know um i wanted to talk to ray and i know i only have 35 seconds Ray, you mentioned additional funding for soft, soft story funding in the budget. Can you, did I mishear you? And, and if so, what is that all about? What are we doing? Are we um, assisting property owners to, uh, or is this grant writing, or what are we doing with additional soft story funding? Great, thank you, Council Member. Ray Bearden, Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, it's a good question. What, the FEMA funds we received, we finally got them uh, okay, good. after three years of waiting. So we received the, the funding program. We're in phase one right now, which is right now we've, uh, the inventory, the, we hired a contractor to look at the, the building stock that we have to begin to identify the inventory, the number of units that uh, meet that definition. We're working on an ordinance and policy that will be coming to council in the August, September timeframe uh, to propose a, that ordinance. We're going to get community engagement through the summer to try and get some feedback and then understand the positions that the, would put the tenants or the, uh, the landlords in so we can get some good feedback and then present that uh, in, in the future here in August, September timeframe. Uh, so we'll be coming back to the, the council on that. Okay, great. So it will come directly to council and not to CED first before it comes? It will go to CED first okay. and then, then council. Okay, good. I know we've been watching that issue and trying to move it forward for years, so I'm glad to hear you got the FEMA money. Yes. 
Thank you. That's it for me, Mayor, for the hey, time being. Council member, just to, uh, to clarify a couple things. Uh, so the, the funding that Ray is talking about is in the current year's, year's budget. So we will carry forward any unspent funds as part of our year-end re-budget re process. So it's a combination of FEMA money and about $440,000 of a general fund match for that, for, for that program. And then just on your questions regarding um, uh, uh, to the police department, um, page 697 of the police department budget section has a couple of budget proposals uh, relating to the sexual assaults program to continue funding for the YWCA as well as um, for a children's advocacy center forensic in interviewer. Just yeah, thank you very reference. much. And some of that was response to the mayor's budget message, wh which we were involved in collaboration on that. So I was really happy to see that. Thank you, Jim, for that update. Great, thanks council member and thanks for adding that, Jim. Let's go to council member Condellis. Um, thank you, I, I just wanna begin by thanking staff for you know, putting together the, bu the budget docs and um, you know, I definitely appreciate the work of our police, fire, IPA and, and, and understand the efficiencies associated with how we run uh, with regards to staffing compared to major metropolitan cities. Um, another aspect of community safety that often goes unmentioned is the work of our Office of Emergency Management and you know, com community preparedness is, is an underutilized uh, mechanism that we as a city should uh, you know, bolster and I look forward to seeing how we can uh, do that with our community uh, emergency response team or our CERT, so great work on that. Um, I, I too, um, like my colleagues, have some you know, major concerns with uh, regards to the emergency medical services field coordinator position um, or realignment. <laughs> Um, more so the risk associated with the elimination of this, of this position. So I guess my, my question for the chief would be maybe providing a little bit of insight into the work of the you know, EMS field coordinator within our department and our broader city uh, in a little bit more detail would, would you know, be helpful for me. Thank you, council member. Um, yeah, I can tell you uh, a little bit more. Uh, so the EMS field coordinator uh, uh, coordinators, one per shift, are responsible for ensuring that field personnel are in compliance with all policies and procedures specific to the performance of, of their duties relative to EMS or emergency medical services. Um, they, they have a, a, deri a, a variety of support functions as well. Uh, they uh, will, uh, at, at major incidents, um, be a part of ensuring that medical care is coordinated, um, uh, especially in uh, instances where there are multiple casualties. Uh, they provide firefighter safety support by ensuring that they're maintaining uh, hydration. Uh, they stand up uh, uh, rehab, which is uh, where uh, in instances where firefighters are stressed, um, overheated, all the things that come with firefighting, uh, they establish a rehab where uh, we go through cool down, we do medical monitoring of our firefighters, we address any, any concerns in that way. Um, they also have, over the years, taken on public information uh, duties on the, in the emergency scene, so you probably have seen them doing TV interviews over time uh, as well. Uh, and like I said, they, they, on top of all of that, they, they are a, a, a handy utility in that they're free to roam the city wherever we need them. So that's, that's a general explanation of their okay. work. Okay, and then so, I mean, so they're internal and external facing uh, positions. And, and so how do we see um, the potential negative ramifications to our frontline fire staff, um, and then conversely to our community. I, I, as I said before, my challenge uh, will be to ensure that there is no diminution uh, of those critical functions. Uh, we will need to find landing spaces for uh, PIO functions for ensuring that all of those, those details, including rehab, hydration, um, uh, all, the, all the utility roles that are played find a, a place to land within the organization. It, it will require change and in some cases some systems design in terms of equipment uh, uh, distribution and those sorts of things. Um, I, I have a, a, a fair amount of, of confidence that we can achieve it, um, but it certainly won't be without uh, pain points as we, as we work through it. Yeah, th thank you, Chief. I, you know, I, I just think we have to be mindful as a council um, in, to, you know, on the potential negative ramifications for our residents. Um, as as my, my colleagues have, have stated, you know, given the dynamics of our city staffing and how lean we already run, um, you know, and the, the more so negative 
uh, effect to our to our residents. Uh, that, that's just a major concern for me. But um, thank you, Chief, for, for the questions, and and, and uh, I yield the, the remaining 50, 50 seconds to. <laughs> Chief, um, when when that proposal came into the budget office and we were evaluating it, I think we felt pretty confident that after you know we added the battalion chiefs and given the structure of how we've got our paramedic program, that you would be able to get through some uh, changes in our service delivery to have no effect. I just want to be really clear that you still feel strongly that we can get through this and not have a negative service delivery impact. It. it, it it is uh, what we are going to achieve. We, we are going to find a place for all of those duties and responsibilities, and we're going to we're going to figure out how to make it work. As I said, we're not reducing the number of people on duty daily. It will require some some systems changes just to make sure we we find landing spaces. But certainly, our protocols won't change. Yeah. So it's just, it is a realignment of our duties among the department. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Anything else, Council Member? Uh, yeah, on that note, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, we're going to attempt to achieve no, but there is a possibility that, that our, our, our residents can have a negative impact, unintended, so I just want us to just be mindful as we deliberate, you know, it's not, it's not a certainty, you know, that it's any systems process and or change isn't, isn't, isn't guaranteed. I just wanted to make yeah. that clear. Thanks. I think it's a, think it's a good thing to flag. I, I do. Personally, I think it's important to defer to the chief on the right way to run the department, and I, I think this is not a reduction in staffing or capacity. It's a realignment of responsibilities. And so I think if, if the chief has concerns, we'd certainly want to hear that budget recommendation and maybe maybe consider putting some more resources there. But this is not a reduction in staffing, just so everybody's clear on that. But I appreciate the question. And certainly any time we transition responsibilities and realign things, I think there can be gaps. So I think that's fair. Um, okay, let's go to Councilor Batra. And, and I just, oh, I'd like sorry. to, I'm sorry, I'd like yeah. to add on one more thing, just to, um, you know, as we monitor our service delivery, if something did happen, I just want to re reassure the council and the public that I know this particular chief, of any particular chief, will give us a heads up if we felt like we needed to do a course correction, and we would come back to council if we needed to. I just want to make sure that we wouldn't just let that fetter because if we told you and the public that we believe we can handle this and we're not going to see a degradation service and that's what we start to see and we can't mitigate that we would come back i appreciate your comments great thanks council member council member Batra. thank you chiefs and the staff for the present presentation and the report um, my question is that as you presented your dashboard the gap between the actual performance and desired performance is continuing to wide from 19, uh, 2019 to 2022, uh, the report which we have. With this budget and the realignments you have done, what kind of a confidence do you have that the gap will either narrow or will not exist in the next report you have in the next year? with this budget, any considerations about the budget or realignments you're doing, are we going to pick up and reduce the gap? Thank you, Council Member. I'll, I'll start first on the police side. Um, as uh, you noted uh, in our dashboards, uh, there has been uh, a decrease uh, in our response times. And um, when we looked at our staffing, uh, it is, uh, there is a correlation, right, uh, with the number of staffing to response times, so um, as compared to uh, previous years. So our goal is to increase staffing to improve uh, response times. In addition, what we're looking at right now is um, redistricting to see if our current resources are being utilized um, in the best and efficient manner. Uh, and that's something that um, we're in the RFP process where we had selected a, a vendor to take a look at um, uh, the ge geography of the uh, of the city and how our officers are allocated. However, any way you uh, slice the city here, um, we, we still need um, increased staffing uh, to provide that uh, that service when our community calls. But that's something that uh, we're looking into, and we hope uh, to improve uh, our response times. Um, 
I can say that uh, Deputy Chief uh, Brian Schaap, who uh, oversees the Bureau of Field Operations, he's also looking at uh, our calls for service weekly uh, to, to see uh, how our, our officers are doing and how we can better uh, respond to um, the calls that we have. Thank you, Chief. I, I wanted to make sure that budget was not the barrier in achieving those remarkable numbers. And I'm, like, I'm very relieved to hear that, that the barrier, uh, the budget is not the barrier. Uh, second aspect, can you comment on it? A, uh, the emphasis on public as part of the safety or plays a role in the safety. Can you comment on if we're going to need to do something different about that one? Or is any budget is required for that piece? Again, uh, from the police side, uh, what we're working on um, as part of the uh, police reforms is a community engagement plan. Uh, and I think that's very important because we need to involve our community, uh, as has been mentioned um, in the presentation, is that it's everyone's responsibility. And I think um, the more uh, the community understands what we do and how we do it, um, there, and also we understand our community, uh, we can provide better services. And that's something that we're working on. In addition to the amazing work that our crime prevention unit does currently, uh, our captains uh, in each division, right, to engage our community and provide the information um, and services that we provide, or we have to uh, better help our community. So that's something that we're gonna continue to expand. Um, obviously, um, our uh, philosophy on community policing, uh, it's not a program, it's a philosophy because we want every officer right, to practice community policing practices. Uh, so that's something that uh, from the academy to even uh, the senior officers, we want them to engage our community, get to know our community. Uh, and that's something, again, to better um, you know, provide and work together on how we can provide better services. And we understand that not everything is a police matter, but we can be a resource to our community uh, and, and, ha and be that bridge. Thank you, and you can count on our offices to help in that process, uh, especially those crime prevention uh, areas where you conduct very, very excellent information session which I had the opportunity to attend one. So I certainly need to bring those more into my community and make sure that we help in that process. Thank you very much for all what you do and good luck in hoping to see better numbers next time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Dawn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Fire Chief. Uh, thank you, Police Chief, and uh, thank you, the Office of Emergency Management, for this report together. Have a, I just want to say that the Met 30 have a myriad of uh, responsibility, including arriving early to uh, account for the occupants, medical group coordinating and triage treatment, transport, mass casualty, um, working with the Red Cross to get the citizen the, the help that they needed. Uh, they also contracted uh, as a liaison with the arson, liaison with the police department, uh, critical roles in IC, uh, coordinate between us and the uh, county EMS, rehab, infection control, fuel, um, <clears throat> mentoring ship, clinical proficiency. Um, so it's a huge amount of responsibility. I, I understand that it is not a, a cut in, in staffing, but as of right now, we do not have a safety officer that, that respond to the scene, nor do we have a PIO. Uh, and I think it's extremely, it is going to uh, negatively impact uh, for our citizen um, when we cut away the Med 30. And I think it's, we, we have to rethink uh, the formulation. The fire department has already been as same as a police department uh, shortage of staff. And per capita, any metropolitan, we should be above 1,000 firefighters. But at this point, we're about 750. Am I correct that, Chief? 720 sworn okay. uh, in the budget. So we, as a retired captain, I, I know the important and the value 
of MET30. Um, and I would highly recommend that because the negative impact onto our citizen and with all the responsibility look at on top of what the daily uh, duties is enormous. So if we cut that position or reduce that position to have battalion chief, we reduce the services to our community. And I believe that somewhere we must give and take somewhere in order to keep up the services uh, from the Met 30. Um, and I do have a question for EO, the Office of Emergency Management. In your budget, um, did you put in contingency to have food and water for all emergency service personnel upon major disaster or WMD for that matter? Because as freeways and everything is shut down, um, how do we expect our public servants to continue to support our community without those bare minimum? Um, Ray Reardon, Director of Emergency Management. Yes, we, that's what the part of that 85,000 is, is to make sure we have emergency food uh, in the Emergency Operations Center. And only at the Emergency Operations Center, so as you well know, if, if there is a major disaster, there, there will be major traffic, right? Blockage, bridges going down. If we only have a central area, how do we distribute that throughout the whole city of a million, right? Or at least 33 fire station, uh, police department, and other personnel as well? It's my understanding we have department operations centers, and they're the ones responsible for the, the service and needs for their employees. And Councilman, if I could jump in on that too, as, as the EOC stands up and uh, looks to fund a variety of different things, and we, we went through this when we had the pandemic, um, when those costs come out, like it's the, uh, the budget office is in, in, uh, in, in engaged in making sure we have resources available in the emergency reserve fund, which provides some seed, seed funding for us to make sure we have enough funding to be able to uh, continue the initial operations of uh, both EOC and the responders in the field um, as a bridge to access the mutual aid and FEMA funding that, that would come in. So for costs like those, if the EOC had deemed that to be a, a, a priority, we would be putting funds into the emergency reserve fund as a stopgap measure to make sure that we had those resources available. Thank you. I'll, I'll use my last 15 seconds. Um, Chief Sapien, do you agree that we need, the, the fire department need to be at a thousand personnel compared to any other metropolitan? Uh, council member, uh, if, if your question is a, a matter of ratio uh, of one to a thousand, is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. Um, I, I, I don't think I would, um, uh, I would distill it to uh, a, a required ratio, uh, what we are focused on is response time performance and adequate resourcing to adjust um, our network as call volume increases um, throughout time periods. So we have uh, set forth in our strategic business plan uh, and you know, as enabled by Measure T to add new fire stations uh, and new resources, been working towards reinforcing daily staffing levels to meet both response times and call volume demands. Well, even at this time, we have station that is closed down and dual company have been shut down. So it would reduce the response time to all communities. And I, I think uh, the, the answer is, I was looking for is yes, we, we need to be at a thousand um, comparing to other metropolitan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Torres? Hey, good morning. Thank you for your presentation today, uh, Fire Chief and Police Chief. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the the foresen, for, forens, forensic, forensic analyst, that's a tough word to, to say, uh, we're adding two of those, and those uh, these folks are gonna help us with Sure, sure. We, um, thank you for the question, uh, Council Member. Um, forensic analysts, what they do is uh, they look at the data, 
right, to um, help uh, that specific bureau. I think um, the ones that we're looking at is to increase our Crime Data Intelligence Center, uh, which supports uh, not only uh, our field patrol, but also our investigative unit, uh, where they comb through, um, as the title suge suggests, uh, forensics, uh, forensic data, which is cell phones, uh, social media, uh, and again, bring everything together in order to identify an individual. Uh, right now, um, don't know the total number off the top of my head, but again, this is just to add to that specific unit so they can, again, help uh, with identifying individuals responsible for crimes. Oh, okay. For, so for example, for like site shows and uh, other stuff like that, right? Major events, yes. Okay. Right. Good. Great. Uh, and I noticed, um, you know, I, I, I really want to commend uh, our MCAT uh, in, within our, with our police department um, because our MCAT is a very important uh, team that deals with mental health in our city of San Jose, right, where we respond to, the police responds to the, to the mental health crisis, not, not the, you know, a lot of folks think there's a stigma to that. So I, I, I do appreciate that, that we are budgeting for, for MCAT. Uh, and then, and excuse me, because I'm going through these pages and <laughs> uh, making a chicken scratch here. Uh, the community service officers, we're adding six positions. Uh, that's just for downtown? Yes, Council Member, um, this um, uh, proposal uh, is to increase um, the number of community service officers. Uh, and specifically add those to the downtown area. So they'll be doing their um, normal duties, uh, but focus on the downtown area. Okay, great. And then we're obviously, I think this is probably a question for a later date, um, but um, we're obviously gonna be working with other organizations uh, like Groundwork, San Jose D uh, Downtown Association to, okay. I see everybody's head nodding, so we can move on. <laughs> uh, the. Uh, the trail patrol program, the, the Coyote Creek, Guadalupe River, that's budgeted for $800,000. Are those officers, uh, is that overtime or is that regular pay? Uh, that's, uh, these are overtime positions. Um, and this is the, um, really the second year that we're uh, funding this uh, together with the uh, Valley Water. No, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I was at, at the Nagley Park meeting yesterday and they, they, they loved it. So, and I told them that I'm gonna be supportive of it. Um, uh, may, so. I, may I just ask a question of the chief? Um, has Valley Water committed their funds? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so that, I wasn't aware that they, because it was supposed to be, a, it's a match. We, we've done with them last okay. several years. Yeah, it's 50-50 match. And I just hadn't heard yet if we had had that commitment from Valley Water. Yes, the, uh, the first year has, but I'll, let, uh, I'll defer to uh, Lee here. Yeah, so uh, our office is following up with Valley Water last week and again this week about a match. And so those conversations have been good. Um, and we can update the council um, before the proposed, or before the uh, deliberations on the June budget message. Great. And, and I'm wondering if we can have uh, this, uh, this program come to PISFIS um, because I do know, uh, you know that there's, there's residents who, who, who want to continue to see the program, but of course we also want to know that the program is working. Uh, so if we can you know, come to PISFIS sometime and, and just let us know on uh, how, how the program is going, that'd be great. Um, as for, uh, I, I only have 30 more seconds left, so I'm just gonna uh, give this comment to the chief. Uh, chief, uh, I know everybody on here is already concerned about the M30, so am I. Uh, so, so, so just putting it out there that it's a very important position or positions for, for our city of San Jose. Uh, but the last question, I think is probably for Jim or whoever can answer it. Uh, how, is, um, how is police overtime budgeted every year? Because I, I know I'm, I'm looking at all the, all the pages here and it, it doesn't ex 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 explicitly tell us how it's budgeted. Um, so how, how is po uh, police overtime budgeted every year? So there's a, um, the, the base budget for police over, overtime uh, is baked into the overall budget. So on page uh, 684 of the police department page, you see what the budgeted cost there is for over, overtime. So for 23-24, that is uh, 20, $24 million. That overtime amount is spread amongst all the various programs that the police department does. So that number you see there is sort of the macro figure. 
then that figure is part of, is split up to the various programs that the police department provides. Um, now the actual amount is, is obviously higher, what, what gets spent in a given year because of the vacant position levels. The overtime actual spent is, is higher because of the vacant uh, officer positions. And so the, uh, the savings provided by those vacancies uh, allows that overtime to be higher. So the intention is, as we're able to fill the sworn staffing, the actual expenditures can get much closer to what the actual budget is for overtime. Great, uh, and, and, and I just wanna let, I wanna let folks know uh, from our public know this. Um, we saw our response times for both the police department and the fire department uh, not at the levels that we want them to. And I've told uh, folks repeatedly that, you know, our, our community needs to know that they need to pull over to the right, because we're, we're not. Yesterday I was on my way to a couple of events where I were either the fire truck or an ambulance uh, uh, put on their sirens, and my, my team member, myself, because they know already, when I, as soon as I hear them, I say, pull over to the right, and people were actually literally like honking at us. Um, but there went the, the fire truck or the ambulance, so, so I, know, um, I know that our fire department is working on some sort of uh, PSA. I didn't see it uh, in the, all the numbers that I see here, uh, so just letting folks know that it's also not the fault of our p police department or our fire department. It's also our fault and we need to do our, our duty in pulling over to the right. Good PSA, they're gray. All right, Count, Council Member Cohn. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate all of the work that your departments do and uh, know that we have some priorities that we've been talking about for a long time, uh, filling our vacancies so we can start saving that overtime money, um, deal, uh, improving our response times. I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, redistricting. The only question that came to me during this conversation was a follow-up on the M30 position. Um, we, you know, we've talked about the functions that are done by those positions and whether they're necessary. And I know Councilmember Foley has said she's put in a, a BD for you know those positions. Is there a possibility that that you know it's not an all or nothing? I mean, there's three positions there, but if there's some tasks that are needed by one person, is there is there an opportunity that there's a compromise here to say you know we need to preserve one of these three positions in order to make sure that some of the things during this transition um, are you know, continue to carry over as a function, but we want to also realign the overall function by cutting two of those three positions and ask that question. Um, I, I think there, there could be a strategy where uh, central, f central functions or, or central support could occur. In other words, a, an administrative position to take on some of those duties and responsibilities. Uh, we, we do not have that in, in our proposal. So I think the simple answer is, could a resource like that work? The, I, th I think the answer is yes, there could be a, a model that, that would include something like that. Um, the, um, the, the, the challenge is that it's a 24 seven service, right? So we, we're maintaining those functions all the time. So no matter what, we're going to have to make the adjustment to ensure that all of those those capabilities are available 24-7. Right, yeah, that, I understood. Um, I, I tend to, I tend to uh, defer to expertise about what are the right staffing positions and not. I also understand that this entire budget exercise with this, you know, uh, weight training book that I carry back and forth every day is, is a trade-off between you know, making decisions of things we all want everything and we're not going to have everything and we're making trade-offs in this entire budget and so um, I, I want to be thoughtful about it I, I don't want to be knee-jerk about these positions are needed because we've always had them and we need to think about how we realign the way we provide service but also think as we go forward are there things that we think might fall through the cracks that that we can staff with with a something in between those two numbers and so maybe these are the you know we have another month to sort of kind of figure out that balance I just wanted to throw that out there as part of the conversation. Thanks. Thanks, council member. Um, okay, so we are at about 1030, which is roughly what we'd allotted here. I still have a colleague with a hand up and I have a couple of questions, but I just wanted to flag that we'll wanna begin wrapping up this segment fairly soon. Um, for Chief Sapien, um, I'm, I'm concerned about paramedic staffing and I appreciate some of the investments we're making to try to catch up. I'm, Curious as you think longer term, how we ensure the, the right staffing levels for paramedics. And I know this is not a challenge that's unique to San Jose, 
and we are making some short-term investments, but as you look farther out, what should the council be aware of as we think about how to more um, stably staff the, the medics that we need? I, I think longer term, we're gonna see a, a natural stabilization. Uh, the interruption in paramedic development was, was clearly COVID related. Um, longer term recruitment uh, to meet all of the goals uh, of, of the department. Uh, I, I think paramedic recruitment is, uh, is a challenge in many ways um, because we require uh, our paramedics to come to us already licensed. Um, it, it means we don't offer an entry level firefighter position uh, anymore and that has implications in, in many other areas. I, I think if I were to uh, have the longer discussion, it would be uh, signaling that there's probably opportunity to invest in recruitment and training so that we can get closer to that entry level model uh, that can really help us recruit from, from our local jurisdiction here and, and, and give uh, our young folks opportunities for the future. Thanks, I appreciate that. I think that's good food for thought as we think about future budget cycles. Uh, Chief Mata, on, to pick up on where Council Member Foley left off on the um, increase in reported sexual assaults. I, I know that at least a year or so ago, we had a pretty significant backlog of uh, rape kits, and I, I know we've made some effort to reduce that backlog, and we have some federal funding we've sought out, but I, I guess I just want to understand uh, to the extent that, that you have the data on hand, where we are with the, with the backlog of rape kit processing and if there's sufficient resources in this budget to uh, bring that down rapidly and make sure that it, it doesn't grow again. No, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll ask uh, our, someone from our Bureau of Field Operations uh, to come down. I'm sorry, Bureau of Investigations. That's uh, Deputy Chief uh, Steve Legorio. Can talk about he oversees uh, sexual assaults unit, which um, again you're right. We have received some funding uh, for uh, processing the kits. Uh, however, um, if they had the uh, the numbers in terms of uh, where we're at and what we're doing uh, Great. For, for the backlog. Appreciate that. Good afternoon. Make sure it's on. Good afternoon, a little low, city manager, mayor, council members, and staff. Uh, D Deputy Chief Steve Ligorio for Bu uh, Bureau of Fuel, uh, you got me tongue-tied, Tony. <laughs> uh, Bureau of Investigations. Um, so for the, um, the safe kits or the SART kits, as they used to be called, um, that came up about a month ago. We do have funds in there. We actually have, dare I say, more funds than we can catch up with right now. So the backlog, um, I, the numbers escapes me right now, but there was a backlog that went back many years, but part of it is, um, uh, you know, the uh, backlog at uh, the county lab and how quickly they can, they can do them. And we were contracted with a private firm um, that opened PO, as I believe, um, is no longer open, so it has to go out to bid so we can start processing those again, because we were given, I think, $300,000 initially to contract with the firm to start processing uh, those kits through evidence, and we need to put that back out to bid so we can start that process again. Okay, uh, so I guess I just wanna confirm that th there is not at the moment then a, a gap around having some additional dollars to speed that up. It sounds like so there, there are dollars there, now it's about that bid and just general capacity to process that needs to be built up. That's correct. It's not a funding barrier. Correct, sir. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, and then in the interest of time, I will just go to Siobhan. Um, quick question on complaint reporting. I've noticed that that has um, gone up as a percentage, the number of complaints coming straight to the IPA, and I'm, I'm just curious what you attribute that to and uh, what we're kind of hearing from the community, and is, is that a... Is that, a, is that a good sign, or what, what's your interpretation of that, that data, and what does it mean for the IPA going forward? That there are more complaints coming in? Yeah, well, as a percentage of overall complaints, it appears that more are coming to your office. Um, I believe that the data will 
be shifting somewhat as okay. um, more recent data shows more people are filing with internal affairs. Um, we are, and we have put out an offer to a person who has experience in community outreach, mm -hmm. and we will be devoting at least 30% of this staffer's time to doing outreach, and as a result of that, we'll see how the numbers uh, change in the coming years. Okay. I just noticed the data in 21-22 was 27%, then went up to 36, and I just thought that was an interesting trend and was kind of curious what what you interpreted that to mean or what funding needs you might have related to that. And then relatedly, I know that there's the uh, portal that was launched in, in response to SB 1421, and I'm, I'm curious what usage has been like and, and what your thoughts are on, on that tool. Well, we've put up some data. We don't have, uh, we haven't been able to keep up with all the more recent um, reports that are releasable under 1421. And then with SB 16, there are additional cases. Um, so we actually have not heard a lot back from the community on that portal. Um, again, it may be due to the fact that um, we haven't been able to do much community engagement due to staffing levels. Mm -hmm. um, so again, our community outreach person, we're redoubling our efforts to put more energy into that. And uh, that portal would be something that we will want to bring out at those engagement uh, opportunities. Okay, great, thank you. Well, thank you all for your presentations and all the work on, on this year's budget. I don't see, looks like hands went down, just last chance on public safety for this study session from colleagues. Are we good moving, moving forward? Okay, great. Well, thank you all again, really appreciate it. We're going to transition now to neighborhood services. And whenever staff is ready, we can jump into the presentation. Oh, I'm good. I'm just in a pain. Good morning. I'm all the way back here. Hi. Good morning, Mayor uh, and Council. I'm Jill Bourne, your city librarian, and uh, today I'm filling in for our fearless leader, Angel Rios, the deputy city manager for the Neighborhood Services City Service Area. Our Neighborhood Services City Service Area has both a broad and complex mission of ensuring that our neighborhoods are safe, clean, welcoming, and vibrant, and that all our residents are offered opportunities for engagement, in public life and for communities to thrive, all with the North Star of equity. As a whole, we provide equitable access, which we approach as an active verb, not as just a thing, um, to a significant portfolio of city resources, assets, staff, and services. Our teams are known for being passionate about our mission. Our work often looks like the most fun and rewarding, and it often is. We have sports and we have story times and kittens 
And we also have the privilege of bringing joy and helping people, often at the times that they need it most. But our work resonates with our neighborhoods because we have possibly the most direct day-to-day -day contact with residents, representing our city and connecting with communities to meet their many diverse needs and empowering them to prosper and thrive. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John to walk us through the presentation. Thank you, Jill. John Cicerelli, I'm the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. Uh, with me today, Jill Bourne, our city librarian, of course, uh, Rachel Roberts from Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, Matt Lesh from Public Works, and Jackie morales Fran from Housing. I'm gonna do a brief overview of the, of the CSA. Um, so you can see uh, the various divisions in Parks and Rec. Of course, we have recreation. We have the maintenance and operation of parks. We have community facilities development, so that's building things, and community service, which is our newest division that includes uh, Beautify. In planning, building, and code enforcement, the primary core service in this CSA is code enforcement. Um, as you all know, uh, PBC has other budget and other funding and other CSAs that you'll hear about in other presentations. Our library department, literacy and learning in the form of lifelong self-directed education, access to information and materials and digital resources. From our public works department, animal care and services, but again, like PBCE, there are many other areas and CSAs that public works is involved in that you'll hear about. And then lastly, housing for our homeless interventions and solutions. To orient some of those programs, um, I'll just highlight a few. Um, I talked about um, our Beautify programming. We also have a zoo. Um, so along with kittens, we have lots of other animals as well in this CSA. Um, in planning building code enforcement, primarily the community code enforcement, the multiple housing code enforcement, solid waste enforcement, and administration of all of those things. Library, access to borrow services, education, early education and family learning. Of course, the main MLK library, which is a operation all of its own, um, and then of course managing all of that. And then in public works, we've got animal services, field operations, so those are the officers are out in the field, licensing, customer services, and of course we operate a very large animal shelter. And, and housing, uh, homeless outreach and case management, interim supportive housing development, and tenant-based rental assistance and rapid rehousing. But before I dig into some of the other stuff, uh, we experimented this year. And so I wanna just walk you briefly through our performance measures. Um, we're the first CSA to modernize its performance measure management framework this year. Um, this will be coming to other CSAs near you soon, um, but for now, for us, uh, we updated the CSA outcomes and strategic goals. Uh, we defined community indicators, which I will speak about in a minute on the next slide, what those are. Um, we updated the core services performance measures, and we updated the activity workload and highlights. And if you look at this graphic, you'll see in the middle there, um, the two columns, you have the mission on top, and then down the left side, uh, qualitative characterization of outcomes, goals, and core services. Um, so in the outcome section, we've got a reflecting on the emphasis of welcoming and vibrant neighborhoods and opportunity pathways. And the, the strategic goals really uh, reflect many of the things we're trying to achieve in the CSA, which include uh, public life and activation, welfare of animals, residents and businesses, services for education, literacy, play, health, and youth empowerment. And then our core services remained consistent. We didn't change the core services, we're just changing how we look at them. And then if you go down the right side, we get to the more quantitative side. Um, community indicators, so what's the impact? And I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide a bit more. Um, then we have our CSA performance measures, how well um, we're doing. 10% of those remained unchanged, 90% of them we modified in some way um, in the budget book. Then to our core services and performance measures, 24% decrease in the number of measures reported, and hopefully that'll make it a little easier and a, and a little clearer um, uh, as we talk about measures in the budget book. And then lastly in that column, the core service outputs, activity and workload highlights, again we decreased many of these um, for, again, for simplicity and, and a bit more focus. So here on the next page, um, these are our community indicators. Um, and so you'll see there's three columns here, and essentially we broke the mission into three pieces. And if you look at the top, it's sort of in a yellow-orange box there. 
uh, the one on the left, the column on the left, safe, clean neighborhoods and public spaces, then the one in the middle, welcoming vibrant neighborhoods and public life, um, and then the one on the right, equity, equitable access to community opportunities to flourish. And so these are, these are sort of the high level data points that we want people to look at. Are we achieving this mission? Um, and so you can see, if you look again on the left side, neighborhood cleanliness perception, and you see the measure is percent of residents rating cleaning up litter and trash as excellent, good, or fair. And you can see we're not doing that well there, right around 40% uh, currently. Um, this is why you see a lot of investment in this, in this budget, uh, this proposed budget. Um, another one to highlight in the middle, um, we have the Healthy Places Index. Um, that we use to look at neighborhoods. This is how we, we have we've ingrained this in many of our decision-making processes. Um, you can see overall as a city, um, you know, we're up in the upper 70s uh, as of 20, 21, 22. Um, however, that also means that there are many that aren't um, doing as well. Um, and so that's why we use that metric to help us make decisions about resources. Um, and in the last column, um, I'll just focus on the bottom one. It's an interesting one that that uh, percent of residents below 200 percent the national poverty line, um, and that is decreasing, which is good news. Um, but that's also still around 20 percent, which is bad news. Um, so uh, these are sort of those high-level indicators. Um, and then in the next one, uh, I'll highlight some of these performance uh, the performance measure dashboard. So. The first column there um, on the left, you can see animal care center live release rate. That's anticipated to remain around 90%. Um, in the second column, I'll look at the bottom one. This is a case where negative is good. Um, so this is percent increase or decrease in overall general code program caseload annually. And so there's a projected 10% decrease coming up in the next year. That's primarily related to, to getting some staffing um, that uh, had been vacant for some time, so there's an expectation that greater workloads will be accomplished. Um, in the third column, I'll highlight the, the one on the bottom, library services quality rating. They continue to do a great job and be in the 90th percentile, heading towards the mid-90s. Um, and then on the last one, um, the, the beautify on the top, um, beautify response times, that one's specific to graffiti removal. Um, dumping and encampment trash services, and so uh, getting to that 80% of the time within the time frame targets, which generally for graffiti is 72 hours for regular graffiti and 24 hours for uh, hate speech or gang graffiti, which is a different measure from this one. A quick look at the budget. Um, you can see there's a lot of movement here. Um, that reflects you know, a great amount of American Rescue Plan funding that was pushed into this CSA during the pandemic. Um, I won't go over all the reasons, but you can see if you start and you look at PRNS at the top there, and you see the second column from the right, you can see the change from adopted um, is, it seems like a big number. Um, that's primarily just ARP money going away. Um, same thing with the library department right under it at 10%. That's primarily ARP and a state grant that's going away. Um, but you can also look to the right of it and see that um, there are investments occurring in both of those areas. Um, and I'll talk briefly about some of those. Uh, last one I want to draw your attention to would be the Public Works Department. And you can see that percent change from adopted at 18.5%. Um, that primarily reflects a substantial investment in animal care and services that I'll, I'll touch on briefly. And then overall, you can see the CSA. Um, we're proposing about $312 million worth of funding for the, in, across these programs, representing about 1,450 positions. So to highlight some of these areas, um, I, won't, I won't touch on every single one of these, but uh, just to start at the top, um, Beautify SJ. So these are proposed budget actions. And you can see that's a pretty substantial number. Um, it represents uh, not only moving uh, some services to ongoing, but also programs that were uh, approved in the mayor's budget message, uh, like waterway cleanups, gateway cleanups, beautify your block, um, and it also includes the continuation of a pilot we just started, which is to try to address uh, RV pollution, bio waste. Um, digital equity programs, you'll see there, um, 
uh, one, two, three, four down there, 1.8 million. That's going from one time, which was, which was helped by ARP and other sources. Uh, we're making that ongoing in this budget. Um, so all those great programs will continue and, and be permanent. Um, measure E, um, you can see a couple of those items. I'll speak specifically to the $7 million item um, there. You know, the, uh, many of you are familiar with it. I've heard some comments about it already in some of these hearings. It's primarily a three-year limited, limit dated funding um, mechanism, looking at adding staffing and contract services, increasing outreach and engagement, um, improving contract management of those contracts, prevention uh, of, from people uh, falling in homelessness, and also trauma-informed specialists that are uh, designed to support the work of BSJ and or the police department as we work with our uh, homeless folks. Um, you'll see the animal care and services staffing one there at 1.3 plus million. Um, the, I think one of the big things there to highlight is that this will take the shelter to 24 hour, seven a day staffing, uh, seven day a week, sorry, staffing. Um, that doesn't mean they're open to the public 24 hours, seven days a week, but it does mean there will be people there helping, caring for animals, cleaning, and doing all the various uh, work. It also adds a second shelter supervisor to support that work and supervise those overnight uh, shifts. So uh, some big changes there. Lastly, I will on the bottom just point you out to uh, the second from the bottom, uh, library security staffing and contractual services expansion. There are actually two items like this in this CSA. There's another one for PRNS of approximately the same value. Um, so a total investment of probably more than $1.2 million. And I just want to highlight this because it, what it reflects is continuing challenges that both the library and Parks and Rec have um, with damage to facilities, break-ins, uh, security issues around employees. So these are, these are security contracts and these are actual city employee security personnel um, that will be helping manage those contracts for us. So um, many of you have probably heard, we just uh, recently had a bunch of koi stolen. Uh, so, you know, those sorts of things continue to happen. Um, and so those investments uh, are necessary. Um, and then lastly, um, just a quick highlight, just a couple things that I didn't talk about already. Uh, starting upper left, the Children and Youth Master Plan. You, you may have noticed on the last one, there's some investment there that's to keep uh, the work moving. Um, this program is expected in terms of the master plan. The uh, master plan will be done in this next fiscal year, and that will provide sort of the roadmap going forward. There will be an MBA issued that was requested out of the, I believe it was through the mayor's budget message, um, that will detail how that, what it would take in terms of a funding mechanism to make that a permanent office uh, uh, for the city. Um, I do want to highlight the um, Across from that, the Beautify SJ Blight Abatement, um, just to highlight that uh, this year we'll be also embarking on a pilot program for private property graffiti abatement. Uh, we'll have more details on that soon uh, about how we would roll that out, but the idea is to start working with and or potentially incentivizing um, private property owners to do more or allow the city to do more to remove graffiti from their properties. Um, and then on the bottom there, on the right, I would uh, just uh, mention again the code enforcement case backlog and case management software. I know that's a bit, been a big uh, concern for code enforcement, so the expectation is we'll be able to start making headway on that one, uh, like I mentioned in the performance measures. Uh, so with that, uh, our presentation is concluded and we're certainly ready to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you, John. Jill and everybody else in the box. Let's go to public comment and then we'll come back to the council. De <coughs> Excuse me, Deborah, followed by Lori. Hi, I'm, I really wanted to do this during <laughs> public safety, but anyway, my name's Deborah St. Julian. I live in South San Jose, District 2. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. I want my neighbor to be able to call a trust unit when her friend, when her son is having a mental health crisis. We know almost half of the people killed by police in San Jose were suffering a mental health crisis. That is why I asked the city to allocate $1.9 million to a fund to fund a second trust field team, team for South San Jose. We don't have one now in place of the proposed one time $5 million to fund police overtime. And also I'm happy to hear 
um, the comments about domestic violence as a volunteer at the YWCA. I support their recommendation to develop a pilot community-based approach to preventing and responding domestic violence based on one of the reimagining public safety um, recommendations. We need to fund alternatives like those recommended in the reimagining public safety report, um, report, not just increase the number of police officers. It's time to, to um, embrace true alternatives to public safety, and you already have a community-derived document, the RIPS report. So I hope we can be bold and be courageous and try new things. Thank you for all your work, and please listen to your community. Thank you. And Tony, I'm so sorry. I was on autopilot I, after the staff report went to public comment. We, we're supposed to do this at the end of the study session. Can we come back to public, in case people want to comment on neighborhood services and public safety? Yes. At the end? Okay, great. Apologies, colleagues. Uh, let's go to Councilmember Foley. Great, thank you, and thank you for the presentations. Um, I have a, a few questions. Um, John, you brought up the Friendship Garden and the Koi Pond, and that's top of mind. Um, but I and I'm concerned about the security. I see that you have additional funds for the security budget. Can you tell me what that's going, how that will preserve our koi ponds and any va and, and our parks in general and any vandalism and security issues? And sure. then the other item, I think, for the libraries, and maybe you could talk about that too, or Jill, is more about personnel and their security and their safety. Am I understanding the differential? And maybe, well, answer the first question first, if you could. Yeah. Uh, Before I go happy, off. Yeah, happy to. Thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, so for PRNS, you're right. It's a bit more. It's a bit more property focused, um, but it's not absent of a people focus. Um, uh, but it primarily is uh, meant to shore up security around uh, Kelly Park, at the zoo. We have a, a, a property yard there, um, and they are frequently broken into both the zoo and the property yard. Obviously, what happened with the Friendship Garden, we've had an arsonist in there this year. We have similar issues over at Emma Proust Park, um, and um, even our own uh, Vegolution, who is one of our operators there, continues to get broken into. Um, and then also Lake Cunningham Park, um, it also continues to get broken into and vandalized. Um, and so this would provide uh, one full-time uh, person to be an employee of ours, a security person, a security position, and a part-time person, and they would run the group of security personnel through a contract. Um, and the reason we're doing it that way is we actually learned a good lesson when we did the evacuations due to the rain, and we opened up shelters at Seven Trees Community Center and Camden Community Center. And at Seven Trees, initially, the private security, they showed up, but they weren't very effective, they weren't well-directed, they weren't sure what to do, and frankly, Thank you to my good friend sitting next to me, Matt Lesh. Um, they sent some of our own personal city hall security staff down there to help us, and it made all the difference. And it made the employees much feel much safer. They were feeling intimidated. There were a lot of incidents that were occurring. So that model, we think, works, and that's why we proposed that. And then I'll hand it over to Jill to comment on hers. Yes, thank you, Council Member. Thanks, John. Um, so you're correct. At the library, as you're aware, I believe, uh, for the past couple of years, we've uh, been implementing a, a security and safety study that we did of our entire system. And the recommendations were that the library uh, employ a much larger security force than we had previously, which, uh, you know, at the time wasn't saying much. We started off literally with one security officer for the entire system. And um, we've been steadily growing with the council support. That team, uh, this action would result in a 10-person team. And that also allows us to not only have a team that is trained in all the, um, the ways in which the library continues to maintain open access for all residents, but uh, a safe and welcoming environment, but also to, to interface effectively with our law enforcement counterparts who support us whenever needed. Great, thank you for the additional information. I think both security needs are critical and very important. John, regarding um, the parks that you mentioned and staffing, 
that's security staff, but are we looking at additional cameras or uh, security measures to keep the property safe? I'm really mindful yeah. particularly of the Friendship Gardens because that was a gift from yeah. uh, Okayama, our sister city program, and there's been vandalism continually. I know you, you're aware of this, yeah. but what can we, and, and taking, making sure that our staff are feeling safe is extremely important. We need to do more for that, but we also need to make sure that we're provide, keeping the garden safe and protected and that and things aren't being stolen or vandalized. Yes, and, and the answer to your question is yes. It involves cameras as well. Okay. Um, in particularly places like Japanese Friendship Garden, which aren't as easy to sort of monitor, they're kind of buried deep in the park and there's dark places around, it's hard to see folks, you know, so we do believe cameras will be a beneficial thing for us to be able to use, monitor, and then hopefully use to then capture anybody who's vandalizing or lighting fires or anything like that. Great, thank you. Um, I have time for one final question. It has to do with the pools. Are we gonna be able to open all of our pools this year? What's the status of our lifeguards and being able to open our pools? And are there any that we will not be opening? Well, our intent is definitely to open them. I know we are struggling still with some of the hiring. Um, I don't know if we have a real-time update, um, Jeremy. I'm gonna ask Jeremy Schaffner, one of our superintendents, to come down and just tell you where we are with that recruitment. Um, I think we're ahead of where we were last year at this time, uh, but still not where we want to be. Okay. Good morning, Jeremy Schaffner, Recreation Superintendent. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, we are currently on track to open the pools on time. Uh, as of current, we have roughly about half of our staff are current returning from our 2022 summer season. We also have multiple pending offers. As long as all of those offers go through, we plan to open on time and with full staffing. I will say that it is with minimal staffing, so we will be navigating if anyone calls in sick or other components, and we are still working to fill all of those positions uh, for the upcoming summer. That's great. I've been getting calls, uh, some of our other offices maybe too, but about uh, summer intern position or summer positions, and these are people with life-saving skills or pool skills, and I keep sending them to your department, so I hope that they're actually going through the certification process because having those pools open is so important for our adults who swim and the kids who swim and benefit from our pools. It's a great resource for us. Thank you. And, and Council Member Foley, I just want to point out that uh, we're very pleased to have finally gotten the aquatics program back into the budget on an ongoing basis so it won't continue to fall out and have to be reevaluated every year. Great, thank you very much. Great, thanks Council Member. Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> First off, I just want to thank staff for your essential work. Um, uh, this uh, CSA provides such uh, necessary services to our families, uh, whether it's libraries, community centers, maintaining our parks, affordable housing, all that, all that stuff is um, essential to the families of my district. So I just really want to thank you for the work that you do every day for our, our families in San Jose. You know, I've, I've mentioned this before, and, you know, publicly before, but I, I do have my reservations in regards to the new uh, strategy and allocation for Measure E. Uh, the proposed Measure E spending plan uh, is a proposal that, in my opinion, um, breaks our past commitments to voters that we made in 2020, and sets back, and in my opinion, too, sets back our collaborative efforts to address both our houseless and our housing crisis jointly. Um, I wanted to ask, can you tell us how staff came up with the current plan uh, on Measure E and what thinking went into how we're trying to balance these important needs? I can, I can take a start with that, no. uh, Council Member. So I think when we were, as we mentioned a little bit um, the previous day, thinking about what Council gave us direction in the March budget message was to, uh, to make some of these substantial um, a surge investments to reduce the number of unsheltered homeless folks on on our streets, bring bring back a strategy to potentially uh, access some of the Measure E funding to help with those efforts. Um, keeping in mind the pipeline of affordable housing that exists, and 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 essentially told us to give us a recommendation about how we could use those those funds. And so, um, when we looked at it, you know, we we had a strategy there that again preserved those affordable housing projects currently in the pipeline that hadn't yet come to council yet, and the associated impacts 
with that, like the commercial space reserve, the inflation reserve. So a half of those funds were preserved for affordable housing. Then we had about 15% or so that we needed to set aside in that revenue stabilization reserve because we know that the revenues from measure year are gonna come in lower probably for in, in, the, in the current year. Um, and then we had that $38 million recommended to then be reallocated for this, for this work. And the thought was we needed that surge of funding for outreach work to get folks um, from out from an unsheltered situation into a sheltered situation, which is that $7 million that was shown on the slide earlier there. Um, as well as uh, the continuation of the San Jose Bridge, Bridge Program, which was also direction in the March budget message there. And then also um, some coordination work in the city manager's office. We, we, we do know that you know, these issues, situations are very sticky, they're hard to deal with, they're interdepartmental and they're interagency. And so you know, to be able to respond flexibly and quickly and to kind of have a deeper dive in, into the data, we needed more staffing in the city manager's office to help coordinate that work. Which then brings us to the uh, infusion for resources for the emergency interim um, site, uh, emergency interim housing site acquisition development design, all those costs there, which is additional resources in the public works department to help sort of un unstick some of those projects to make them go um, perhaps a, a little bit faster, but also provides some flexibility and funding to also stand up some safe, safe parking sites um, so we can uh, have the flexibility to bring more folks from an unsheltered into um, some sheltered capacity. But then just as importantly, the prior direction that we got from council to develop 1,000 emergency interim housing units um, already had some pretty significant costs related with it. So when we did, I'm sorry to be long, so I don't mean to take up your, your time, but this is, I, I know we want to get this on the record. So um, you know, th those 1,000 emergency interim housing units already had with it um, some pretty significant cost imp implications. And so uh, when we changed the measure E allocations last year as through a very pu public process for 15% for homelessness support, we also had with it the long-term analysis of what the operating cost would be for those EIH sites. So when we talked about it in February, we had that analysis. Again, in April, when it was finally approved, we had that analysis. And then we also had as manager's budget addendum number three, when we actually approved the, the budget, said, hey, we got this, we're gonna do this $40 million of one-time funding, but to the extent that we bring more EIH officially comes online, they become committed additions to our base budget. And so that, what that means is then, barring any, any other resources that come uh, available, we need general fund money to support that, that, that work. And so at that time, it was, um, you know, when we were projecting out to 2930, we had operating costs of approximately 40, 45 million. And if you got to that point, and based on the, the, the um, if all those units got, got built and the, the state funding started to dwindle, dwindle down, you'd be looking at somewhere for $32 million of ongoing general fund support by 2930, starting if up. I, if I just, down. before my time uh, yeah. runs out, let me just ask one more question. And, and, and so, I mean, I'm sorry, okay. just, so we need, so, so that $19 million spent, spreads the runway out. So if council, I guess to say that if council wants, we, if council is continuing down the path to be able to reduce unsheltered homelessness, it's a pay now or pay later situation. So that's the direction that that's what we got. So that $19 million helps uh, provide additional capacity before the general fund needs to kick in even more later on. Sorry. Go ahead, council member. I know you have a follow up. You are at time and I have a bunch of hands, but go ahead and ask a follow up. That's fine. All right. I, I guess I'll go back in the queue afterwards. Um, is it possible? I know you just said a mouthful, but is it possible to either bring forward a memo or a, a presentation on how the measure E spending plan differs from the current one? Yeah, so I mean, you mean a uh, memo from, from staff? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think, yeah, when we put out the, um, the MBA, we'll, we'll, we'll show the, the updated version of MBA 3 that we did last year. We have some additional sites we want to bring on online and the pace for that. And so you'll see an updated version. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Cohen. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with my favorite topic, libraries, and then jump into Measure E again. Um, and, and this isn't really a question, but a comment about the prioritize, how I've prioritized libraries. And I want to appreciate library staff for the interim step we took this year. I call it an interim step. I don't think that we're done until we have fully restored hours and opened all 23 branches on Sundays. So um, while I was hoping last year when we, we put funding in the budget last year to get us partway there, and actually more than halfway there, um, that we would maybe talk this year about the rest of it. But I've I do believe that we ought to be thinking in next year's budget. We still have, we, we can wait one more year and next year's budget we ought to be focused, thinking about how we can fund 
uh, getting the, the rest of the libraries open on Sunday and make sure all branches are open 43 hours a week and not just and not some at 39 and the rest at 43. But I want to thank the staff for the fact that last October we did get partway there by opening what 16 or something on on Sundays and have many of more than half our branches open in the key areas 43 hours a week. So that's the I just want to make that comment on libraries. Um, just following up on these questions on Measure E, and this is a tough one for me. I mean, this is one of those situations where we're in a budget discussion where we have to make trade-offs um, between multiple priorities. No doubt the affordable housing priority still in my mind is number one, but we also have made a lot of a direction as a council over the years for interim housing, which are really, really important to all of us and to our constituents and to the people who are still living in the streets. And so. Um, I just want to be thoughtful about how we do it, and I look forward to the MBA that's going to give us more details. A um, couple of questions, I guess. One is, I think that, Jim, if I, if I read this correctly, you were talking, this was a taking operation for multiple years and pulling it out of this year's Measure E allocation. Is that correct? It, it is a combination of uh, construction support and operating costs. But multiple year operating costs? Um, or is it one, is it all for just the current fiscal year? It would be costs? added to the pot of the forty million dollars that we did last year. It gets added to that overall pot to provide that capacity for additional construction or for but that can be used flexibly for construction funding and operations mains. And we have currently used, for example, uh, this last year we used it for both. So we used about two and a half million dollars to support the expansion of the Gua the Guadalupe um, EIH. And then we're also tapping some of it for a couple of the EIH sites. I can't recall which ones, but we are using for some of those. Okay. Um, and, you know, one analysis I'd like to potentially see, and I, don't, I know this, I don't know if it's easy or not, but we talk a lot about the cost of serving, the cost to the city of a resident that's unhoused on the street. So I think we've heard numbers of $60,000 a year is what it costs for each person living there because of all the work we have to do in terms of cleanup and, and support. And then the question is, is the, is the cost that we then spend in this manner, by, by reallocating Measure E and actually operating these sites, lower per person served than it is for them being un housed on the street? Because that information is important when we talk about the trade-off of where we spend our resources. Because we're spending resources on them when they're not in EIH as well, right? All right, I'm, I'm gonna just jump in first. And first of all, I'm just a little hurt that you uh, love the library and didn't uh, <laughs> say you love the, uh, the housing department, but that's okay. Um, I'm kind of used to that. But, um, I love the housing department, too. All right, thank you. <laughs> I love all our departments, but, you know, you know, I have a soft spot for what did, what did Jim say yesterday? That's assumed. <laughs> <laughs> right? Wasn't that his line yesterday? But, okay, I'm getting over that. But your first question regarding the cost to provide the services. So the number that... Um, we're quoting actually comes from a study that the county did and the cost of the county services for the highest need people mm -hmm. so it is not you can't translate that cost to what it costs the city because they actually didn't have any city data to talk about what the costs are for cities to actually provide services like the cost to our fire department every time they have to go out or the police or the light, you know, so none of those costs are actually documented, and it was a very extensive study uh, that took years for the county to, to actually um, get that number. Um, so number one, you, um, th that number doesn't really apply to the city. It's a county number, highest users. So people who use the me their medical system, jail system, high frequent, high cost people. Okay. Yeah, I just think it's important for us to also just think about we, the fact that we, the more we get people off the streets, there is some savings that are realized and, and that it's important for Absolutely. us to make sure that the community understands that. I was going to just make one quick comment at the end about um, the reason why some of these costs are coming. We, we've, we've, as a council, we've been pushing for opening an RV site. We've been pushing for getting more EIH beds. And we also originally had a direction of using public land, right, so we can make really good deals um, it would be easier and cheaper for us to, to stand up public land, but honestly, I, I think some know, I was skeptical of that from the beginning. I was pushing for us to, to look at private land, and we are now finally doing that because we found out that public land is not as easily accessible, it's not in the right places, it's not going to be as flexible as maybe some of the private land. When we start going and looking at private land to do what I think will actually be better, 
it will cost us more, and we have to have some budget for that. So that's also another part of this that I think needs to be articulated as we think about this balance between how we spend measure refunding in the previous manner and how we're going to spend it going forward. So that's, that'll stop there. Thanks, Councilman. I think those are great points. I also think we should just acknowledge that there's a macroeconomic situation here that is forcing a tougher trade-off than any of us would like. We had measure revenues in excess of 100 million a couple years ago. This year we had hoped for 70, but it's going to come in a little lower. Next year we're looking at 50. I'm ballparking. I'm sure Jim is, wants to give the exact number, but um, that's a significant decline, and we expect this to be cyclical. We'll have years where Measure E's bringing in 100 million and years where it's 50 or less. And so when you look at completing the projects in the pipeline, setting aside money for cost overruns for, exist for the affordable projects we're committed to, setting aside a $15 million reserve to deal with the fact that it's, it's coming down and we don't know exactly where it's gonna land, providing the staffing to do outreach and delivery of EIH projects, there's not a big delta there. The reality is for this year, the NOFA that would be possible would be pretty, pretty modest. Not to say there isn't a trade-off. Those would be some affordable units. So I'm, I'm not arguing that there isn't a trade-off there. But I think part of the thought process here is maybe we can do a spike on more immediate, creating more safe placements around safe parking, which we desperately need to address our RV issue and interim units where we can accelerate those safe managed spaces and hope that we cyclically get back to a point where the measure E revenues go up and we can put together a larger, a larger NOFA soon, as soon as there's the revenues to really have a big impact with it again. So again, th there's certainly a trade-off, but I, um, I don't want people to think, I think Councilmember Cohen said this well, that there is this either or we're only with one strategy versus the other. It's a, it's a portfolio of strategies, including things like safe parking, that if we want to address RVs, we're going to have to put some dollars into. And I think we should do that sooner rather than later. Um, it also is very clear, I think, and I'll move on to my colleague in a moment here, when we passed Measure E, that it was, uh, the discussion was affordable housing and addressing homelessness. That was, that was very clear from day one, and, and we're always changing the allocations based on our needs around housing and homelessness. Okay, let's go to the next hand I have up is Vice Mayor. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for your, um, your information. Uh, one of the things that I don't like to be is confused, and so uh, I have a few clarifying questions. So um, on the uh, slide number eight, when you're asking for proposed budget actions, I'm just wondering on whether it's Beautify San Jose, Measure E uh, uh, for Homeless Response, or San Jose Bridge, do those incorporate ongoing costs? I know Jim mentioned that for some, it was gonna be sort of a three-year type thing. Is that included here or not? So for that $7 million cost, that was the cost for a three-year period. For the $3.5 million cost, that was the cost for a one-year period. So that, San Jose, so that San Jose Bridge program, that would extend the San Jose Bridge program through 23-24 only. Okay. And that's so, described in, um, in the proposal itself. There's okay. a more detailed description. Yeah, so, so we're looking at seven million over, I mean, no, it would be seven million each year. No, no I'm sorry, that's seven million dollars to be spent over a three year period. Okay, yeah. okay. So I think sometimes it's a little bit confusing. I know that when we're thinking about, you know, uh, uh, whether it's a, bo uh, a council action, um, uh, if things change in the future, if we create that action uh, in this budget cycle, does it automatically go into the next and we just say, oh, well, that was uh, in the pot already? Yeah, so if you would look on uh, page 796 of, of the budget document, it, it gives more depth. We sort of try to kind of write a lot about sort of what's going on there. So for example, for that $7 million for homeless response and, out, and outreach, we talk about the positions that it, it funds over a three-year period. Um, mm -hmm. And so, that funding, absent any other council direction, that as that funding gets spent down over a three-year period, it will get carried forward to the following year uh, through our normal re-budget year-end year -end process. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking that if, for example, it turns out to be more than you know uh, that over that three-year period, let's say you spend it in the first two years, right? Uh, then in the 
in the second year, then you'd say, well, you know, we really need X number of dollars in a future. I'm just, I'm just sort of wondering how it is that we allocate future uh, 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 dollars to a specific action and how we, because I'm thinking that it's going to probably cost a lot more. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm just wondering, you know, how, how you put it in a, in the fund, and then you say, okay, this needs to be spent over three years, uh, and if it ends up sort of like being finished in two years, then, you know, we go change it, or? Yeah, so what we try to do is we try to be specific as possible when we're writing about the budget proposal, like, hey, this is going to be spent over a three-year period. But let's say something comes up, and man, we had to spend this, this, this money faster. One, we should be telling you as it's happening that, hey, as we oh, monitor okay. The, okay. the budget, like, this okay. is happening faster. If right. we then we do run out, we have to come back to you again and say, hey, we, we need to allocate more money. Here's our recommendation to, oh, to okay. do it. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's, that's very helpful because I'm just wondering, you know, over a three-year period, you know, how does that come up? But it comes back to us, yeah. so that's, that's terrific. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, one of the things, John, that you mentioned in terms of uh, some of the costs uh, uh, for security, this is on top of what is reflected in the budget summary. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, this, these are new ads the, for PRNS. Okay, and so, it's, so it's what the budget summary is, and then on top of that, you would layer this, these uh, other actions. Or is it included in those numbers? It, this is part of, this is an addition as part of the proposed budget. We, we have, we currently have some security contracts uh, that we utilize. We have not had the permanent city staff to help manage those. Okay. So this action would add the staff and I think we boosted the amount on the security contracts a little, so it was in addition to okay. and carried all of that into this next year. Okay, and then lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Jackie for clarifying. I think that it um, really is gonna be important to uh, look at numbers that pertain to the city versus other entities when things come to us so that we're not repeating or thinking that uh, this number is the number for San Jose. So clarity on that would be very helpful in the MBAs. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilor Abatra. Thank you for the impressive list of items you are trying to cover in this neighborhood services portion, and also for making adjustments to the budget for getting rid of the money, which is not available to us as a part of the uh, one-time funding which we received and making adjustments to the budget and the services so uh, and the priority like homelessness uh, question i have for you is uh, this park like uh, guadalupe river park where there are statues and other gifts from uh, other sister cities is that protection of those, preservation of those comes under any of these services? Only to the degree that those would be in either Emma Proust Park, Kelly Park, or Lake Cunningham. Um, the ones that are in GRP that you're talking about, the sister cities, this does not specifically address that. However, there are two things that are happening in that area. One is, and you talked about it in the CSA before this, there's a PD patrol on bikes that go up and down the trail that goes right past this area, so that will help. And then just as we're speaking, uh, we had an addition in this year's current budget where we're adding a dedicated team of maintenance folks to the Guadalupe River Park and Trail System. So those will be people that will be there every day, seeing what's going on, be able to keep the areas clearer, keep the weeds down so it's not so obscured um, and so it doesn't get ignored. Um, so I think those two things in combination will help improve security around those, but our security proposal is not specifically for that. Okay, so specifically the recent vandalism which happened on one of the statues, that recovery and or doing anything with that one is not part of these services. Is that part of some other group's activity? Yeah, in, in terms of, for example, replacing or repairing it, um, that is run through the city manager's office of the city sister program, um, or sister city program. Um, but there's no, even through that, there's no specific security related budget items for that space. Okay. 
All right. Okay. And again, thanks for the excellent work and uh, got a large array of services and big adjustment of the budget with the all the one-time funding disappearing. So appreciate all the work done. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Councilor Torres. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation and uh, thank you for for all that you do, not only to our our directors, but our uh, our city employees who work within these departments. You have the um, the most important uh, departments in the city of San Jose. Um, so, first off, uh, I like I really like that we continue to invest in uh, the community university program. Uh, I think that's uh, super important. Our city can't do it all, uh, and so having community university in the McKinley Bonita area and the Washington area is uh, you know super important. So, um, but also. Um, it's very important that San Jose State students come out of wherever they're at and into our neighborhoods, our beautiful neighborhoods in, in, in District 3, so thank you for that. Uh, I do have a, uh, you know, I'm going to ask my questions at the end because I'm starting to realize that five minutes goes, goes by real fast, especially when you have to answer the questions. Uh, so the, I, I'm appreciative of that. Um, that is a question. So. Uh, the, and, and I know that the, the vice mayor touched up on it. Um, I see that we uh, we have 12.3 million to the to beautify San Jose, and then we have an additional 150 thousand uh, for the for the beautify your block. That's intertwined, right? Yes, that's all contained together. The beautify your block is a pilot. There's several pilot programs that were reflected in that 12.3. So only about eight million of that is ongoing. The rest of it is a bunch of new programs that came through the mayor's budget message and all of your blue memos. Uh, and I mentioned some of those in the presentation. Yeah, yeah. great, that equal $12.3 million, obviously. Okay, great. Uh, animal care and service staffing, I think that's incredibly important. You saw that for, for about two months, we had a, a bunch of animal rights activists come out and, and tell us that we need to invest more in, in uh, not only in personnel at the animal care center, but for our furry, Friends, and so I'm so glad that we're, we are doing that. Uh, the question I do have, because it, it is a little bit concerning, and gosh, I had it here. Anyways, I memorized it. Uh, in, in 2021, we spent over $3.9 million in our senior nutrition program, and this year we're budgeted, I think, at 1.1 million. I don't want to make it seem to our public that we're not, that we're taking away money from our seniors, but I just mentioned the year, and 21, 20, 21, 22 is the year, obviously, that we were still having this pandemic. So is that the reason? Yes, our, right. food, our food distribution is scaling down dramatically. Okay. Um, in particular, when it comes to seniors, you know, we were doing a drive-by where they, right. we would just load it up and keep them going. The numbers that we were serving, in some cases, were double or more than who, the, the people we'd been serving before. But now that we're back in person and all together in the same room, doing congregate dining, those numbers are starting to stabilize. Okay, And the, of course the money is going away, right? It's American right. Rescue Fund. Yeah. But are we still, are we still offering, are we still offering uh, drive-through or uh, delivery or, or, or whatnot? I don't, are we, Jeremy? I don't believe we are. But uh, I'll ask Jeremy again to come up and speak to that. Good after good morning still uh, Jeremy Schaffner recreation superintendent uh, council member uh, we have ceased doing the drive through models uh, consistent with our county contract and the state funding that we receive for those programs it does uh, require us to be in person and so all of our 13 sites are in person okay. um, we do offer a couple of components in unique circumstances based on medical needs but we are back to in person with no pickup models great thank you Thank you. I just don't, don't want to make it seem that we're not, you know, that we're, in, you know, divesting on, on our seniors. Uh, w one other question I have, the Google community benefits, we got 1.7 million uh, 2022 and 2023, I think this is for Jackie, um, and this year we're getting none. Is that because of the big announcement that they just recently had? No, it was a one-time. Just one-time thing? Yes. Okay. Well, I wish we could have that money back, but I guess that's not going to happen. Uh, the other one is, because uh, I know that uh, it was this, the 
this presentation was, uh, was, was with other departments. Uh, John, um, I heard you touch a, a little bit about the youth master plan, uh, and it's, so can we, so that's, that's gonna be obviously funded next cycle? That's correct, it's proposed to be funded. Okay, great, ongoing, I hope. Um, I don't recall. Yeah. I believe it's limit dated, Jim. Yeah, so I think we have the carryover funding from the American Rescue Plan Fund will be re rebudgeted as part of the year end to continue that, that work as we're still wrapping up the uh, master plan. Okay, great, and, and I hope, you know, I, I, I really do hope that uh, this uh, youth master plan is, is ongoing, you know, with, with the issues that we have today, right, where our residents um, see crime, um, they see un the unhoused, um, that's because we, we don't invest in our, in, in our youth. And so it's, it's extremely, extremely important to, to let everybody know that, that our city is committed in investing uh, in our youth. Uh, so thank you. And council member, if I may, I believe that the recommendations from the youth master plan will be coming through the neighborhood services and education committee yeah, uh, this, prior this to great. next year's budget cycle. So um, you'll have uh, a chance to discuss them then. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Okay, Council Member Condellis. Awesome. Um, I too want to start off thanking staff. Uh, Neighborhood Services is my favorite CSA. No offense to my public safety folks out there. Uh, <laughs> see, you see what I did there? Um, <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, sincere appreciation, education, digital literacy, broadband, you know, I, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about Measure E and you know, I understand the, the housing crisis we're in. We, I mean, we hear it day in, day out from our residents. And, and you know, but I, I do have some concerns with regards to how we're approaching and the risk of treating the symptoms rather than the root cause. Um, and, you know, what I want to clarify is keeping in mind uh, the Measure E reallocations as currently proposed, what is the risk to our general fund and ongoing commitments, for example, in Attachment D, of the city manager's budget memorandum, you know, it, it, it states total annual costs of about $50 million if we get to 29, 20, fiscal year 29-30. Um, and that's, correct me if I'm wrong, that's directly coming from our general fund um, unless uh, external sources are identified. Yeah, so there would be, a, a, that's the overall operating cost um, as, we, as we had it in, um, in last year's MBA three, it would be about 32 million from the general fund. That'll be different. Um, and just to say, I think that the the allocation of this funding doesn't commit the council. What would commit this? Not, not the council. What would commit the on ongoing funding? What what does the commitment is when we bring forward uh, committing to uh, constructing an individual EIH site? At that point, council also is faced with the choice of making this a committed addition. So at that point, those things become an ongoing cost for the sites that we currently have. Um, operating uh, and and committed to, we don't have that massive obligation yet with the funding that 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 we have. It's as we bring on the remaining amounts, that's when the ongoing costs really start to hit. Right, and if we, I mean, if we if we move forward with the current proposal and we have an infusion of money to be able to identify, develop, and stand up these sites, that would essentially put us on the hook to 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 on, to ongoing costs of maintaining these sites, which. To Jackie's point earlier, we don't have a, a tangible known cost, so that that's that's a, a, a tangible risk to our police, fire, recreation services that you know we should be cognizant of. Um, and and so, and Council Member, if I may, just, Council does have one more time before that commitment makes. So it's when the site comes online is when the actual commitment or when the site is is contracted to be built is when that commitment takes place, not the budget allocation it itself. So there's another opportunity for Council to weigh in. Great, and, and, and so, but, but my point, the point that I was making is to my council colleagues, in, in the justification is that we would be seeking external sources, whether it's federal, Project Home Key was mentioned from the state government, but you know, the legislative analyst office, which is nonpartisan, just said that the California legislature is in, is in the hole for $19 billion next year, or this fiscal year. So uh, let's be realistic in our approach to how we talk about external sources, external funding, that you know, we're gonna have the federal, the state government coming in and save us from you know, providing services that we are essentially enabling. And, 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 and to, to that point is conversely to the, the current Measure E conversation, something that I think would be helpful for our discussion is something that I, I stated in, 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 in a memorandum I wrote for the mayor's budget message was, what are the costs? What are we trading off 
with regards to you know uh, the, the the permanent support of housing and, and so or something a little bit more permanent and I, mayor earlier I, I heard uh, a comment about um, putting out a modest NOFA so I, I guess I my question for staff is you know as because of the direction we provided to to on measure e on the reallocation of sources what 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 is what, what did that cost us what, what what could have what nofa did we lose at the cost of that and and, and to 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 build housing and, and to do more affordability you mean of the measure e fund specifically Correct. the roughly 18 19 million for eia so specifically eih and safe parking no 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 uh, for for a nofa that we did last year i think it was uh, what 50 million that we uh, that we have on the hook for for building housing and that's currently and, in the pipeline. And right? that's kept, that's all preserved. Right, for the next fiscal year. To do a NOFA for the following year, for the next fiscal year. So for so for Measure E for yeah. next year, um, the allocation plan, um, we would have had $36 million for affordable housing. Okay. And so we could have released a 36 million and if we have any money left over, you know, we could have added that uh, from our other funding sources, but 36 million is what would have gone to affordable housing. That and, will not. And uh, Jackie, can you specify? It's that's not just because of EIH. The, that there's if you add up all the things that go into that, the EIH and safe parking is about 19 million. So I think we should just be clear about what is included in there to be clear about what the trade-off would be. That's not just yeah. We're not putting 36 million into EIH. That includes the staffing and the homelessness outreach and the prevention. Doll. That, that includes a lot of other right. Things. But but I mean, thirty six million dollars in my opinion is not a, it's not modest. It's a good a chunk of money that we can throw out into yeah. the market. So to put for, it in perspective, yeah. I'm talking with some folks behind. Oh. I'll get, let you ask a follow up. All but right, on Cathedral you. Faith, for example, which was one of the projects we really want to get funded next, their estimated need is about thirty million for one project mm -hmm. from the city. Right. But uh, yeah, and I would just say that is a huge. It's a big. It's about two hundred. How many units? I, I think it's even. Two two forty. I think two twenty. Rachel's like 40. saying something. Yeah, it, it could be funded under two tranches. It's it's um, yeah. not necessarily because that's a big one. But it yeah. is a big one. It's yeah. like two projects. So it's one. probably two. That's what I was saying. It's probably a, two, a one big project or two projects. Right. So, it, uh, I just want to clarify, just because uh, I think we've been throwing out a lot of numbers, right, and, right. and Jim just. Make sure, check me too, and, and I think it's 38 million. Is that correct? That, that we've, re, we've reallocated out of the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Plus, we're recommending at this juncture not to spend 15 million of our estimate, given the need to not want to unfund any of the already council-approved projects. So I, I think that's correct. Is that right, Jim? Because that's the number. Mm -hmm. That, that is also that's what we're, we are are we are reallocating as part of our of our of the proposed so budget here. But Jackie is also correct in if if the proposal wouldn't have gone forward, there was thirty thirty six million dollars for affordable housing in the twenty three twenty four bucket based bucket. on the percentage buckets in yes, the so, in the policy. Yes, yeah, so I just right. want to make sure that you understand because you're hearing thirty six or thirty hearing thirty eight. But <laughs> the trade off question is is this thirty eight? I would not consider right now. I would never recommend to you this fifteen million uh, set aside because eventually that. It, that would get returned back to this fund if, it, if we get, make a revenue estimate. We just want to be cautious and not have to undo any commitments that we've made. Right, so I, I want to clarify because what you, what you haven't been able to see are the allocation plans. And so af actually the 15 million that we're holding in reserve is coming from the unallocated pot. So that's completely different. Then in the new fiscal year, you know, we're anticipating we're going to get $50 million. So there is $36.6 million that would have been allocated to affordable housing that's not being held for that $15 million, but is getting reallocated for a variety of responses for homelessness. And again, I think when you see the MBA that breaks out, here's, the, here's what's happening with the unallocated amount versus what's happening and what we budgeted going forward, you'll see where the different pots are going to. So it's somewhat confusing to have the conversation now on the detail, because you can't see that right now. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Jackie. And that would, be, that would be helpful detail to have, and I'm assuming that's gonna come out in an NBA, and Jim, would that be NBA number three, or is that some sort of, is that a different? <laughs> It'll be one of the next ones to come out. 
Okay, so sure. that so we are going to be, be seeing um, that that uh, that information in in a MBA. Just to yeah. clarify. Perfect. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Dewan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for the this incredible uh, report and, and eye-opening of the cost uh, to run all these program. Um, thank you, PRNS, for the new scholarship and continue with uh, animal care and child's and youth program. I know that the historical park, uh, one of the historical house has been burnt down and, and also a large warehouse. Um, I wonder, are we looking at some funding to rebuild that or are we gonna leave it as is? Um, just to, to give some clarification, the house that burned was a historical house in History Park. So it's, it's not a typical park amenity or that we have a funding source for that. So I believe our friends in Public Works have been working with them to look at what can be done. I'll hand it to Matt. Yeah, so on that building, we're going through the insurance process. It was uh, a fire scenario, so we're determining what will come out of that in terms of options and then what also the operator of that facility wants in terms of optional, uh, the optimal replacement for that particular building. So it can't be a like-for-like -like because it is an older building, it's a 100-year-old building that burnt down. So. Right. Um, hopefully the insurance company will, will um, kick out some funding in order to replicate at least um, to what it is uh, before. Well, thank you, and, and, and same as um, my uh, other council member concerned, Pam Foley, regarding the security, and I, I do notice that $690,000 is, is going towards security and, and securing both uh, Happy Hollows and, and the uh, Kelly Park. I thank you for that. Uh, in your budget, is there a funding to continue at least um, a small amount of uh, funding toward the uh, the Vietnamese Heritage Garden that have been neglected for the last uh, more than two decades. Thank you, Council Member. So uh, we, you and I have talked about some, some minor improvements we can do. That we can absorb within our current resources, so we don't need a specific budget line item for that at this point. There is the issue of, of wanting to move a bathroom or a meeting space. That's a bit larger of a piece of money, um, which we don't yet have the estimate for. Um, so that may or may not be a funded uh, project, but some of the landscape design and things we've talked about, those those we can do within our existing budget. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Um, okay. Looks like everybody who's wanted to has gotten a first pass. We're back around to Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, personally, I'm an unapologetic cat man just went to the animal care center, I think a week or two ago, and uh, rescued or uh, fostered uh, a new baby kitten. Uh, so I have a question in regards to the animal care. Um, are we keeping track of the you know, cats or kittens that we're not able to take in, that we have to turn away? Because I know that in, in my district, obviously we have a feral, I think in a few districts we have some feral cats running around, so I wanted to see where we were on with that. Thanks for the question, Ann. Thanks for the foster. You are all welcome to join and come. Many of you have come for tours. You can walk away with a pet and or a foster. So um, we are not cataloging every single animal that is not coming into the shelter. Um, that's one of the challenges. We've kind of debated how we best do that. Um, we have that challenge to staff of how to collect that information because right now, and especially yesterday, we put a hold out to the community saying, please don't bring healthy animals into the shelter right now. We are completely full. Um, so that we don't, so that we can care for the ones that we already have. Then, so we are, that challenge to staff is how do we catalog those and, and characterize where they were particu particularly picked up or trapped or where they were found so we can have location information. Um, that, that's a challenge we're trying to meet this month of how, how to identify that and if we can catalog that and then report out on it. Thank you, uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, so my, my next question is just a return to uh, Measure E. With few alternative sources of affordable uh, housing dollars available, I wanted to ask if we're measuring um, how this would impact the, the, uh, the reallocation of funds. How would the reallocation of funds impact our ability to invest in new affordable housing uh, developments in the future? 
Well, I think you know one of the challenges is we're sending a message to the development community regarding you know again not releasing funding that we would have previously released, and I can't help but thinking about Jim's comments of we're building this reserve for the general fund's protection because we are creating a liability the ge to the general fund as we construct these interim housing uses. So to the extent, as one of someone had already mentioned, we don't have continued funding from an outside source to fill this gap, I, d I <laughs> I wonder uh, if there will be continued actions by the council to continue to build a reserve to protect the general fund from having to absorb potentially a $50 million liability as you continue to expand these. And so I do think that's the longer term question you all have to grapple with is there is not enough money to pay for it. And so if the general fund doesn't have it now, you know, what will be the funding source? And I think this is, from my perspective, it signals that potentially Measure E will continue to be that. And mm -hmm. um, I think that that's the signal that I would be worried for on the development side. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think it goes without saying my district is practically begging for more affordable housing given the displacement, especially the Mayfair uh, uh, community who's vulnerable to displacement. Um, and then I, I think I did ask this question yesterday, but I just want to double down on it since I believe Councilmember Candelas mentioned it. So I think I raised um, you know, concerns in regards to the ongoing costs to EIHs um, as we establish them. Uh, are, is that calculation, given you know, the EIHs that we may uh, develop with um, the Measure E funds, if reallocated, is that going to be measured in the MBA that's going to be uh, released? Because you know it, it could cause impact to future uh, budgets. And what I would hate is what we build today is continue to siphon money from Measure E um, because we're saying this is only a, a one-time uh, thing. Uh, so the answer to your question is uh, absolutely yes. And so that was what was the um, intent. Well, when we changed the policy the last time when council set us on this thousand unit unit goal was that these units would be committed additions to future base base budgets, and that's what council had approved. And so um, absent other funding sources, they would become an obligation of the general fund as part of the base, base budget. So we will update that um, for you. And when these come to council for consideration as part of the recommendation items that uh, is, is shown to council, in addition to awarding the contract, there's language to make these committed additions to future base budgets so it's all sort of clear in what future council actions take. And then, and then finally, um, in regards to Measure E, when that was first pitched to the community, um, and I'm asking this out of innocence or, or ignorance, really, when that, was, when that was pitched, was it pitched that a majority of funds would be for affordable housing and then a portion would be for homeless services? Or was it, oh, it's going to fluctuate up and down and things may change? Do we have any information on that? I mean, we may want to. It was pitched as a, a measure for affordable housing, and it is a general fund obligation. And the previous council made a decision to to create a new uh, uh, to start shifting the percentage allocation and to make it broader um, and to provide more resources for us to meet the tremendous need that we have. So, you know, it is this policy mm -hmm. choice that you all get to make on where that balance is and okay. how it gets worked out. Thank you, that's all, Mayor. Yeah. yeah, and to be clear, it it was and had to be or it would have been misleading to the voters to represent it as anything other than a general tax. It was a, it was a very clear, um, lower, we went for a lower threshold. The, I remember the, the marketing at the time, which included a lot about affordable housing, but also addressing our homelessness crisis. Um, I, I do personally think, and this will be a discussion for the council to have in the weeks ahead, I, I think we have agreed in the past and will continue to likely agree that building housing for our homeless residents is a, is a, is a key need that we have and that this is an appropriate source of funding to do that. I would, I would also, uh, I would caution us against thinking about the policy environment is being too static. So the housing authority is currently looking at ways of being able to allocate new resources to help with the operation of interim units. 
For our affordable units, we are extremely dependent on state and federal sources to operate them. That's why it's not a cost to us, but that is impacted by budgets. And so it's in a constantly evolving situation. I think what we're gonna find is that it's less of a binary of housing versus shelter and one's good, one's bad. I think it's gonna be a spectrum and as the state and federal government leans into ending unsheltered homelessness, I think you will see more support for interim solutions, though we all know that we're gonna need more affordable housing. Final note I'll just make on that is, I think we're gonna all have an opportunity to be very engaged in and vocal about supporting what will hopefully be a regional housing bond that will be at a scale that will put this debate, um, make it very marginal. A regional housing bond that would literally allocate to the city of San Jose a billion dollars and to the county a billion dollars for affordable housing. And not that we won't need a lot more than that. If you do the math on our RENA targets for affordable housing, 34,000 units at a million dollars a unit, we're gonna need to go out there and find $34 billion to meet our, commitment, our, uh, our targets. So um, anyway, I guess my point is there's a lot of fluidity in this and, and I, I would be careful about thinking about it as being static or a simple binary. I think we're going to need different solutions for housing our unhoused neighbors. And we're going to need some that are faster and cheaper to deploy, I think. Um, and I think you'll see the state do more to support those in the years ahead. Okay, um, we are going to need to allow members of the public to comment. I do see some additional hands up for a second round. I, maybe we can give each colleague who has a hand up one additional question, and then I'd like to make sure we get in public comment, and we, we did make this a time certain end point. So we'll go to Council Member Cohen, and we'll try to get everybody in. I'll put my little doggy up here for my animals question. Um, just a quick question. We, 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 you talked about our shelter. Uh, sorry, it's a little m monopoly thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, you talked about the shelter being overcrowded. We, we don't just handle San Jose, but we handle some other cities around us. I just want to understand the, the funding. We're getting funding from those cities. Are we getting adequate funding? Do we, do we have to revisit our model for how we're supporting regionally rather than just San Jose for animal care? Thanks for the question. We do have contracts with all those other supporting agencies, and we believe they are proportionate to the animals that are coming from and the services that we provide to those areas. You just approved the one for Milpitas uh, Tuesday, and so that was a similar scenario where we look at you know, are we providing how many animals are coming from that specific area and what services are we providing from the field in that area. We believe we're generally aligned um, and we're constantly looking at whether we need to make changes. All right, thanks, that's my only question. Great, thanks council member. Uh, Councilmember Torres? Rachel, you, you thought you were gonna get away with no answers, but because uh, you got no questions. Uh, just Can you just talk to us a little bit about the code enforcement case backlog uh, case management software, and uh, how does that look? What does that mean? So, um, thank you for the question, Councilmember Torres. Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. Um, so our general code case backlog is the number of cases that we have open and active um, that are assigned to our general code program. Um, and so, because of staff vacancies, uh, we started out, I think, it, about 18 months ago, we were at a 30% um, vacancy rate in our inspector classification. We have worked to improve that overall to 14% as of this month. Um, but we did recently just uh, become fully staffed in the general code program in March of this year, so just two months ago. So we're hopeful now that we're fully staffed that we'll be able to start to work through some of those cases to reduce that backlog. Um, uh, we currently have a number of cases that haven't been able to be worked, and so we're, we're looking at redistributing that workload and, and get moving on that. Um, the case management system is something um, long overdue. Uh, we have uh, set aside funds that have been um, put in place for us to secure a new software system. It's what allows us to manage our workload on a day-to-day -day basis. That's where all the information for each case is is recorded and that's where we um, generate all of our paperwork and do our tracking and it and allows us to manage the cases coming in and going out and, and seeing all the actions that happen um, as we resolve those cases. So our current system is from 1999. Wow. And so we're really looking for some significant improvements. Um, we're in the RFP process currently um, to secure a new system and we're looking forward to all the um, modern bells and whistles it's gonna bring. Great, thank you.
And I graduated from high school in 1999, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we still have two hands up. We're short on time. Let's make them real quick. Councilmember Candelas? Yeah, no, super quick. So um, just a request for, in the MBA, um, in, in the council policy, it has each uh, revenue. So 10% for homeless prevention, 40% for new affordable housing for ELI, 30% uh, for new affordable housing for low income. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to see that broken out with the new proposed measure E reallocation because the, in the attachment is just all clumped in under 75% and we clump those different subsects that of, of, of allocation of funding uh, into, into just affordable housing. So I'd love to see what we're, what we're allocating with um, our 40% our extremely low income household earning less than 30% area median, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, do, you, do, you, do you need a little bit more clarification? I'd just love to see that as we are proposing and as we are discussing it, how we're- In terms of the reality. projects that we have committed to? Well, in terms of with the funding, yeah. yes. So again, so just to be clear, Measure E requires that we have both a spending plan and that you, you uh, uh, have a allocation plan as well that was approved by the previous city councils that we're required to follow. Perfect. So the actions that we're taking require us to change those percentages. And so that is what our MBA will include is it's going to demonstrate here are the required pres um, percentage allocations broken up by ELI housing, low income, moderate, and then the homeless, and even the administrative bu budget because there is a change to how much of a percentage set aside we're using for our administration. Okay, so just, it will it was show clear, yeah. both of that for <laughs> okay. the unalloc you know, the, the money that we're taking from, uh, that hasn't been used, Analogy, and then yep. for the measure A going forward. So there are two measure. spending plans you need to review. Got it, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Batra, let's make it extremely quick, please. Okay, so I, I, there has been a lot of discussion about the allocation of funds from a Measure E. Uh, one of the, I'm concerned about the affordable homes, but if you look at it, in the last few months we've been here, every dollar which we had in the Measure T did not result in having an additional affordable home because we have approved in the last at least three months, three or four times, the doubling of the funds which were already committed for the same number of units because of the inflation, because of other reasons and all that. So it didn't that the first time we gave $12 million and then we didn't, I don't know how many months, but certainly after I was appointed here, I've seen that same number of units we increase our city's funding by $15 million. So as a result, yes, we are reallocating here, or we are proposing to reallocate to the uh, shelter versus unshelter. It is being debated at all levels in the state. You have the bill from Alex Lee, who wants to change totally the, how we build the affordable homes. And that measure, if we ever, uh, if that bill ever passes, our measure E funds will be going totally differently. So I think considering our problem of the affordable homes and, and the unsheltered, it is a fair time to evaluate if our policy needs to change a little bit to accommodate what the current crisis is. So I don't think it is that we're taking money away from the affordable thing and moving towards the shelter is something dramatically wrong being done. So let's keep that in mind. Let's understand whatever allocations were in the time of when the Measure E was proposed and how the crisis has developed further. So, and we have solutions for affordable ones through Section 8, some other rental assistance and things like those, which can temporarily get us over. But the unsheltered one, there isn't much of an alternative there to accept to give them shelter. So I would suggest let's keep that in mind and then evaluate our policy. And I'm open to having this discussion more. If you want to allocate time for Measure E discussion, of the allocation, because this has gone on and on back into the neighborhood services, which is probably 
fair place to discuss, but not for this long. Okay. <laughs> appreciate the feedback. We are in the interest of time, going to and appreciate my colleagues' patience. We're going to get to public comment and then get everybody on with their days. Lori? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lori Catcher. I am a 20-year resident and voter in District 6 in San Jose. I'm also a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. Um, I really appreciate all the discussion this morning um, as I've listened in. Um, and I have comments both on public safety and neighborhood services. Um, as a community member in San Jose for over 20 years and a mom of three young adults, I've been an active volunteer in the community. And I really see the need for creating a better community of belonging, a community of care. And um, as public safety um, presenters spoke about residents sharing in public safety and prevention, um, one of the ways that I would like to see the city do that is to ask the city, the city to allocate $1.9 million to fund a second trust field team. It's an alternative crisis response team for the city of San Jose. Um, this will relieve our police officers for matters of crime and put mental health professionals to respond to mental health needs. This is something that we as citizens can call for help for a family member, a friend, an unhoused neighbor in mental distress, and we can begin to care for one another in a better way. As well, um, we support the recommendation to develop a pilot community-based approach to preventing and responding to domestic violence. Um, I know that the mayor mentioned this in his budget message. It's based on the reimagining public safety recommendations, and it addresses Council Member Foley's concerns that she brought up with the greater increase in reporting of rape in um, domestic violence situations. So I ask that you please to support these as well. Also, we don't need a Band-Aid. Um, I know the housing situation is complex, but we need new permanent affordable housing. Thank you. Liz, followed by Catherine. Liz Holtz. Okay, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I'd like to um, address council and let you know that um, we are all very thankful uh, for everything that uh, council is doing to um, consider assisting with the uh, difficulties that the San, Animal, uh, San Jose Animal Care Center and Shelter is experiencing. Uh, we are very grateful for um, the city manager's office, um, both for implementing the stakeholders meetings uh, that are being held by Angel Rios, um, as well as the um, proposals for the additional funding uh, for the San Jose Animal Care and Services at the shelter. This is very, very important to our community. Um, I appreciate that, uh, you know, everyone is trying to work together to get things rolling. Um, now we see significant um, uh, changes coming. We see a lot of cooperation. Um, we're very supportive of the increases in the funding, especially for increased staffing, which is desperately needed, as well as the repairs to the facilities. Um, the uh, only other thing that is not addressed that we feel that sh strongly should be addressed um, is the quality of the data um, at the shelter, because that is what everything relies upon and determines the community need. Thank you very much. Catherine, followed by Dinah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Catherine Hedges and I live downtown in District 3 in affordable housing. I'm also a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. Um, living in this complex, I've overheard multiple incidents of domestic violence in my building, but I've hesitated to call 911 
because I've heard that armed police officer intervention can make matters worse. Therefore, I support the pilot project to prevent or respond to domestic violence as recommended by RIPS. I also worry about failure results of police 911 calls for mental health or substance abuse crises. Um, we all know how many of our police shootings are happening in those situations. This is why I ask that, that the city allocate 1.9 million to fund a second trust field team for the city of San Jose instead of allocating 5 million to the police department um, overtime fund. And I also oppose adding 20 new sworn law, law enforcement officers and the other increases to the police budget. Those funds are better spent on non-police alternatives. Additionally, I strongly oppose the reallocation of all the Measure E funds to interim housing. Um, and the idea I've heard that we want to build an Austin style shelter where people who don't meet all the requirements have to lie in concrete patios out mats or sleeping mats is totally inhumane. It's be worse than concentration camp. Nobody should be forced to accept shelter under those conditions. We all know that once the unhoused people are out of sight, out of mind, that will relieve the pressure to build permanent supportive housing or additional affordable housing. Stop pandering to the next door voters and keep the original measure E fund allocations or make a smaller allocation for interim housing. Thank you. Dinah followed by Ruthie. Hi, I'm Dinah Hayes. I am a resident of district six and I wanted to thank the council, the city manager and the mayor for their continued focus and support for animal services. I know that it has been, again, a challenging year for animal services and appreciate the efforts shown in the proposed budget, as well as those city council members who have personally made visits to the animal shelter and submitted additional requests for uh, funding and support for animal services. And again, thank you for the support. Ruthie followed by Paul. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ruth Callahan representing Coozer Woods Neighborhood Association. We support the mayor's reallocation of Measure E funding. Since 2015, the housing department has been focused on funding brick and mortar buildings and not closing the encampment. Emergency interim housing funding is the only way to stop the flow of homelessness into our city for the free services, which the corporate nonprofits lobby for. The housing department policies have brought on a state audit because San Jose has not made any discernible success. The objective should be to close all camps, move the population into mental health and drug treatment facilities, and then into skill-based programs resulting in parity wage jobs. The lack of affordable housing isn't the cause for increasing homelessness population. It is the substance abuse and the lack of mental health facilities and treatment that the city refuses to address. Nonprofits need the homeless in order to survive, and the city has far too cozy a relationship with them, including city department heads who sit on the board of directors of these entities and nonprofit founders who chair city commissions. Thank you for your time. Paul? Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ruth. <laughs> she hit it on the money. Um, absolutely not. You're not going to con the voters, man. You see, because Licardo and Camus came off the dais and begged me. They literally came off the dais, walked up to me while I was in chambers, and begged my support for Measure E. Measure E, the promotion of that was done right there in front of Second Street Studios. So this was this was the con, is to convince the people using Second Street Studios as the backdrop 
And Locardo was in, dressed, you know, in attire, nothing like that. He had his jeans on. You know, he, he really wanted to look like a, a person of the people. Okay, and, he did, and it was done in front of that for a reason. So you're not going to be reallocating these funds. You're going to do exactly what it is that you told the voters that you were going to do with that money. And that was to build more housing projects, exactly like the one that was used as the backdrop in order to calm the voters. So that's number one. Number two, I was very, very surprised that I heard from this guys that people on the east side beg now, let me tell you something. I don't know who they were talking to, but I'll tell you this much. A Chicano will never beg. A Chicano demands, and then he sets expectations. That's what he does. So I'm really not, and it, that surprised me to know that a representative of the East Side would literally, like, put his people in that kind of, no one begs. We're demanding because of the racist policies that have infected us, because racism is a public health issue. If you don't believe me, ask Dr. Sarah Cody. Dr. Sarah Cody had made, made, made that explicit. Also, look for the RAND uh, study. There's a RAND study being done by the county, and it's going to be produced on June 6th. Look for that, and you're going to find a lot of information. Back to council. Thank you. Thanks again to everyone. We're adjourned.